Mm -hmm. All right, it's on. We're back on it again, and it's recording. So let me see what I can do. Let's share screen. Let's share it with chapter one. Nothing's coming Hey, go to the uh, computer and try to zoom in for my link. Uh, I have one student call me, couldn't zoom in. But I'm up, it shows I'm up. So see if you can see if you can join. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Good. Um, what what drop? No, no, no. But if Did you see what Mama wanted? Save them to the okay. end. I'm gonna hit my recording and start resuming now. So we're back to recording now. Um, first question is, what's the difference between a manager and a leader? Between a manager and a leader? A manager and a leader. Yeah, the manager is only trying to get things done. A leader is going to let you develop your ideas, but still guide you and let you build your ideas. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, because like a leader is someone they lead, but they also know how to learn while they're leading, and 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 you know they don't just you know I don't know. I guess it, they have progressed to being a leader, a manager. They right. Manage, they manage, but like she said, they're a manager. Is someone looking at more like production, and you know, you micromanage, or you can you know. You know, so different levels of managing. I, I, I don't know where I'm going with it. I don't know if I hit down or not. Well, I mean, to me, a manager is all about the company, where a leader is going to help you develop your skills into progressing into the management area. Do, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It Can y'all hear me? Because I, yeah, I have my ear. Okay. Okay, so my two cents is, for me, managers are taught. They're skilled and they brought to a level. A manager as leaders, you really, it's a, a innate, it's not, you can't teach a person to be a leader, to me. That's the truth. You either have it or you don't. Right. 
Okay, good, because you just, that's awesome. If I had like a cookie, I'd give you a cookie. That's my next question. Yeah, I'm <laughs> that, that's my next question is, uh, are leaders born or made? Now, I suspect the military people will answer this way, because in the military, we don't like the word management. We like the word leader. So I call myself a leader. I'm a lieutenant colonel, so I lead. Now, mm -hmm. reality is, 90% of my job, guess what I do? No. I manage things. However... You expect me and want me to, and you want me to be a leader by, that's how it works. So that's how it goes. So I've been trained or pushed towards that, exactly what y'all talking about. So I agree. I don't disagree. Uh, there's also other schools of thought. We'll get into that. So, but next question is what you, what you said. So I know what your answer is. You're saying, and, and Denise, you agree that leaders are, it's kind of innate. It's a trait that you have. Mm -hmm. So um, are they born or made? I don't I don't agree with that okay I don't agree with that because there's a lot of people that are leading that have lived their experiences that a manager cannot ever they're just they're just taught how to manage okay right but that's why I say leaders are born because like, like for example when I say born you're talking about created. Born equals created. Yeah, but so what I exactly. mean by that is, yeah, 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 um, yeah. I agree with that. Born, you know, they have you born with a certain uh, knack about yourself. It's, it's like, okay, for example, you, uh, yeah, you have some people that are born to be athletes. Just naturally, they have the body size. They parents to be they parents to be just rinky deep, but they came out six six eight two hundred. That's just how they were born. The physique to do it. Where now you do have people that are smaller than that. They can train and work to be athletes, you know. But Charles Barkley. That's the, you know, yeah, you know. So that's where I would say you have your leader. That's you know, and then you have the manager. So leaders are more born. You're born with it, you know, to be a leader, not a follower. You know, like, age one. Yeah, okay. They're they're born. But when I think twenty, I don't think like you can like they he put himself in that position. I don't think he was born to do what he did or how he constructed, but he figured out a way to... Fear. Exactly. So I'm just saying, he still could naturally do it, So, but he was still at the end of the day. That we did. What do you think? Born or... I was like born. born. Because I'm proud of the 5'1", and my son is 6'8". Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's about that. Mm -hmm. I can't throw a free phone. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Uh, Thomas, what do you think? I, I kind of agree to born, uh, as far as they're born with the natural ability to lead and people gravitate towards them. That They can learn more by experience and probably enhance those things, but I think it probably takes a, a natural born person to just have the wits about them to lead. Okay. All, all good thoughts, I agree. I would like to think, I, I've worked, uh, I've tried, because we're in a management class, um, uh, which has to do with leadership, um, and management does. They're two different terms for a reason, but they go hand in hand. Uh, and then in the military, because we have leadership training, <laughs> uh, I would like to think you can train folks. Uh, now, my limited experience has been tough. I've seen people go through officer candidate school, get that bar put on them, and they can't leave a lick. Right. Mm -hmm. They can pass the test, but so I, I'm about 80. Exactly. That is so true. So I worry sometimes. I'm like, man, is this a for vain? But it's not because there's some skill sets that everybody can pick up and they can do. And if you put yourself to it now, obviously, there's going to be naturally, I think, some people more apt to lead than others. You know, um, it's always bad when you got that one guy. Who thinks he was born to lead, but he ain't any good at it. <laughs> you know, I was that guy in football. I thought I was born to play football, but God did not give me the body. So fortunately they have a way of keeping you from doing that. Like you don't get to play anymore. <laughs> right. Uh, sometimes in leadership, we'll find out as we started the course and go through this, people are put into leadership positions, management positions, and they're just not any good at it. And it affects you. Um, because a lot of times there's no real test. So in football, there's a test that we practice because in sports you get to practice, right? So you have that ability to see if you're any good or not, or at least have a good predictor. Sometimes in life you don't do that in businesses. 
So we think they're good. So we'll get into that. All right, good discussion. Uh, we'll talk about that. So let's go into managing the managers. Uh, next slide, management, what is it? The book version, person responsible for supervising the user and the organization's resource to meet his goals. That makes sense? And this is what you say we can build the, the slides? Yes, okay. these slides, yes, okay. you can. Uh, you'll see these online and you'll have my voice talking over them. Or you can turn that off and you can just read them. Okay. However, my slides are vague and I talk about them because that's just my style. But uh, So that's when I start talking over them but not having people have to sit through the whole class either. So, uh, so it's not death by PowerPoint. The, I thought you said you were military. I am. I am. It is going to be death by PowerPoint, unfortunately. <laughs> but what I've done is, is, is I, like I said, I've got you the uh, PowerPoint up there with my voice over it versus this whole four hours of us discussing everything and trying to go through that, or just reading the slide and trying to figure out what I'm talking about. I don't like that slide that's got five paragraphs on it that I just copied out of the book. So, right. you know, so yeah, I'm just trying to make sure. You know. Yep, this 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 you have access to. It's under my slides uh, for each week, or you can go to materials and look at it. So, uh, here's the key to this: person responsible for supervising the use of the organization's. What's that last word or that word after organization? Resources. resources. Yeah, to do what? To meet yeah. so, We're going to talk a lot about that throughout this course. Resources. Some people just miss that. So you are a resource manager. You lead people and you manage resources. That's my thing. So by default, you're going to have to do both in a management position. But you need to manage your resources. You can't really lead resources, right? They're kind of static and don't talk back. People, if you just try to manage them, it's best. And y'all kind of mentioned and hit at that. It's better when someone engages you and tries to lead you and motivate you. We'll get to what a leader is in a minute. Does that make sense? So you can't forget about resources. A lot of times we do. Uh, and definitely don't forget about your organization's goals. Um, and we'll talk throughout the entire class. That's the overarching theme. You've got to know where you're going to get anywhere. If you don't know where you're going, you're not going anywhere. Or, heck, you're already there, as Dr. Sue says. Right? So the reality is a lot of organizations miss this. I think we've all been part of that organization. You just work and what are we getting back? Right? You need to have goals. So that's what a manager does, and they're responsible for that supervising that ensure that we're getting the goal not doing the work but ensuring the goal is getting there sometimes you have to do the work too all right so management what is management is the book definition is the planning organizing organizing leading and controlling of human and other resources controlling of human and other resources to achieve organizational goals effectively and efficiently hmm. these are two big terms at the bottom and i wish that they didn't look and sound alike because these terms are different. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between effective and efficient? Or let me ask this question. Which one is better? Is it better to be effective or is it better to be efficient? It's better to be effective. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't if because mm. I work for I work for a um, a rice company. And it, I mean, it's great that you're efficient, but I'm also in the sales department of this rice company. So therefore, you have to be effective and efficient, but effective is way more important than efficient. I would agree with that. Uh, can you be efficient without being effective? Yes. Can you be effective without being efficient? That's where the military part comes in. <laughs> Actually, you probably could. So let me ask you this and put it this way. Uh, anybody familiar with Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Uh, I bought that book one day. Okay. Good book. Great guy that wrote it. Did a lot of good stuff. And this is so – his name's Covey, Stephen Covey. Uh, not in your book, but uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It is well worth the read. So he teaches Seven Habits. It's a course, and I got the luxury of going to it like four times. I don't know if that's because I thought I needed it four times. I just got lucky. <laughs> Sometimes you get reduced. But um, I like this. I say four times. I don't think I've been – I might have facilitated a couple of times. But anyway, I've, I've been through the course. Uh, Stephen Covey asked it this way. Uh, is it more important to do things right or do the right things? That's really what effectiveness and efficiency is. So – which is more important, to do the something right or do the right things? 
stuff, but one speaks to effectiveness and one speaks as efficiently. So if we are, if our job is to produce product A, right? Mm -hmm. To get to product A, we have to produce product B first. And we're really, 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 really good at doing product B. But you also have to have product C to equal A. Well, you can be really efficient at one thing, product A or B, right? But if it's not getting you to your end goal, then you're not effective. Does that make sense? So doing things right is definitely important. You know, we have that old saying, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. We've heard that before. But efficiency speaks to how well you do that individual task or that particular task, how efficient you're at it. Effectiveness is overall what you got done. So if, if my goal, all right, let me just put it this way in college terms. We've heard this many times. I talk to people all the time. I got, uh, so you've been to college? Well, yeah, I've been to college. I got 226 hours. So you got a degree? They go, no. You're efficient at going to college, right? It takes 124 hours for an accredited degree to graduate in the United States of America. Did y'all know that? So anything over 124 hours, you've lost. You can be efficient at it. You can make like A's in every one of those classes. But if none of those ever, and you took 200 hours, and these are like real life cases. I've got none of your brothers that did this. You keep changing majors and you never get a degree, right? So you go to apply for a job that must have a degree, right, to get in. You don't have a degree. You say, well, I got 200 hours. You don't even get an interview. So you could, and you, but, but I had all A's. You would be very efficient at going to college, but not effective at graduating. So if your goal is just pure knowledge and everything else and, and make A's in every class, perfect. Then you're effective. But if your goal is to graduate, you're merely efficient. Does that make sense? So effectiveness is really what we're after as managers in an organization. Do not ignore efficiency. You want that, right? And you want to get that there. Many times I see people, they worry about the efficiency part and they lose sight of what the overall goal is, right? Sometimes people like me and my end of the leadership chain, we forget about efficiency and we say we're just over that overall goal. And we just go right to work really hard on things. And there's somebody smarter that's been doing this a while going, you know what, though, we can do this more efficiently. So as a manager, you got to listen to both. But because the terms look alike and sound alike, most people kind of say we're almost synonyms. And they're really, really not. One speaks to individual motion and the other is goals overall if you're getting at it. So don't be effect efficient at going to college. Be effective at graduating. You don't want to be here for much as we love to have you here every, every class. You want to graduate at some point. So that's my example of that. All right. Organizational performance. And I already talked about efficiency and effects, and I do that all the time. I get ahead of myself on the slides. So I get fired up about this. Okay. There are four tasks uh, of management um, that the book defines. Planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. As you see by the... Uh, uh, chart on the screen, they're interconnected and interwoven. So where do you start in this process? What's the first thing you need to do? Yeah, here we go, good, planning, right? So planning, you need to choose the appropriate organizational goals and courses. So before you even jump into the plan, and this is what I'm gonna do, you need to understand, and it says choose, so for you, owning your own business, you can choose what your goals are. For the rest of us, pretty much in management, unless we happen to be the CEO or something like that, they're gonna tell you what those are. Either way, the principle's the same. Seek out what your goals for your organization are, right? Then you look at your, uh, choose your best course of action to achieve those goals. So unless you own your own company or you're the top dog, when you determine what those appropriate goals are, make sure that they're the companies and you brief that to whoever you're responsible for, to above you and below you so they understand it and also do the same thing when you pick a course of action. Now, course of action, you don't have to brief below you to get buy-in, you just brief it that this is what we're doing so they understand where they're going. But you definitely want your boss, you wanna say, this is how I plan my strategy to get after your goal, sir or ma'am, is this. Before you take off and do too far or get into this, make sure they understand that and they give you that head nod. This is the kind of stuff, now here's a business practice, not in your book, this is a business practice, so some free chicken if you would. When you do that, 
I like to brief that in person, but I put it in a slide PowerPoint, right, some, or something, and I ensure that they get that. And I ensure that they see my writing and they get a copy of it. So when they later on say, wait a minute, I'm disappointed there, Stephen. That's not what I wanted you to do. I can say, well, we talked about that, sir, on Friday, or ma'am, and we can see that. So um, my job, we have a mechanism for that, a support form that says what you're going to do. But in business practice, a lot of people miss this. So you want to put that into play before you ever really even get started. So that's planning. And then you get into the actual plan of what you're going to do. So you got to make sure you're hitting the right goals and that that course of action supports you. Next, most people skip this one, organizing, right? Man, am I guilty of this one. This is why me and my wife are married for many other reasons, but this is why, because this is what she's good at. She will be a good organizer at everything. Me, I want to jump right to leading. Some people want to jump right to control. Me, I just want, I want, to, I want to motivate you. I want to talk to you about it. I want to get fired up and I want to lead you. Doesn't do much good because you're going to look at me like I got two heads when you don't even, when we're not organized correctly. Or that's a good way of putting it. Really what happens is at some point, a week or two into this process, I get disappointed, you get disappointed, and then you're going to push back to me and say, how was I supposed to do this in the first place? Because I didn't take the time to organize for you, <laughs> right? And organizing speaks to establishing tasks and authority relationships, in their relationships, by the way. So as managers, this is my line and my thinking, not my line, but the line that I prescribe to is this. I am not the boss, no matter what position I'm in. The mission is the boss. I merely have a piece of it. My piece is usually in the management side. Your piece is to do this. Um, I am no more important than the lowest person doing the most menial task. And that guy that's up at the very top living in a nice house ain't any more important than me. We're all the same in my mind. That's me, that's my worldview. Um, with that though, you need to make sure that your worldview, of how you see this particular task and how you see this going is communicated to everybody on your team. So they understand that. So I want you to know if you work with me, that we're a team. It might be that I'm in the management position, but you have responsibilities too, and these are what you're gonna do. I want you to understand that, and you, I want you to understand mine as well. Uh, I like to do that. Uh, but I a lot of times skip that step. Used to always I skip that step. I was that guy, you know, and don't be that guy. But you can, you know, always take time after you make the plan to set up and then talk about in, in, that, in that keywords relationship. It's not so draconian to the fact that I'm the boss, you do this, and I'm telling you what to do. That's not really organizing, that's just restating the obvious, right? Organizing is defining relationships, and you have to have a relationship with everybody. Right, so kind of like we did at the start of this class. You're a student, I'm an instructor. This is what I expect to you. This is what I'm going to give you. That paper, we, we went over task and authority. Your, your task is to write this paper, right? My responsibility back to you is that every turn is give you feedback on what you do or anything you do in this class. That's my responsibility. We have a relationship now. So I owe you back something just like you owe me something. That's a relationship. Um, and then you want them to allow people to work together to achieve the organizational goals. Goal for this class is to learn something. Goal is not to make an A. Goal is not to pass. That's your personal goal, that's okay, but we'll be incongruent on in our thoughts. And you'll go, man, this is not the best class for me. If your goal is to learn something, because that's my goal, and we line up, you're gonna learn something. If you learn something, you will make an A. I'm sure that that goes, right? So secondary is making good grades. It's not that it's not important. So that's really how that works. You got to organize. So first thing we did when we started the class, um, sorry, Zoom students, I missed that portion. But what we did was we uh, went over that organization, right? I spent a lot of time, but that's important. So now we're all clear, right? Uh, so that's good. Next part is to lead and motivate, or lead, which is motivate and coordinate. And like I said, we jumped to that a lot of times. Uh, some people skip that step because they just, like you talked about not being a natural born leader, they don't like that part. They're really into that organization part or something else and they never get into the leading part. They never leave their desk or their office, right? Get out and walk around, got to motivate, coordinate, energize individuals and groups to work together to achieve the organizational goals. So that's when you, you know, continue to do that art of leading, right? Not the science. So when someone's in there and they're having that bad day, you can work with them, get the best out of them. 
Controlling, very important that we miss this one. Establish accurate and measuring monitoring systems to evaluate how well the organization has achieved its goals. Most of the time when I see an organization that's failing at meeting their goals, the other stuff you can point to, but this is really where they failed at. The leader failed to control. Just because you're leading doesn't mean you're controlling, right? It don't mean they're following, it don't mean they're doing what you said just because you're the boss. Here's how you do that. You establish benchmarks or monitoring systems to see where you're at so that you make a course uh, correction. So think of this way, if I'm piloting the ship across the Atlantic and no one bothers to check me, the captain doesn't check to see which way I'm going every so many nautical miles and he waits three days and I was off just a hair every day, I might not end up, if I'm going to England, I might end up in Iceland, right? And then I got to make a big, huge turn and go way south. And that costs time, energy, money, resources, right? And everybody's angry. You want to make small course cor corrections. So the way I see it as a manager, same thing on the riverboat. If you know the organization of how it works, you have a captain with a boat and you have a pilot. The pilot drives it. He does all the work. He's driving it. He's having to make sure everything's right. He has a lot to do. The captain walks around and is in charge of everything. But one of his key tasks, if the captain doesn't do this, he's in trouble. He's to check in on and ensure that that pilot is on the right course. The pilot does not have the authority to change the course. He only has the authority to drive it down that particular course. Does that mean the pilot won't change the course? No. Yeah, he won't change the course, right? So as a manager or the captain, you got to do that. As the pilot, you got to know that if you are going to change the course because there's a rock in your way or something else, then you need to announce that and let everybody know that. Does that make sense? That's controlling. So either side that you're in, and you'll be on both sides as a manager, right? You'll be having to control people and people will be trying to control you. So you wanna make sure you're hitting your benchmarks and you're being checked on, and you wanna make sure you're doing that for your people. If you find yourself in that situation where your boss is absent and he doesn't want or she doesn't wanna control and check those, do yourself both a favor and bring them back to the table and ensure that they do that for you. Set them up yourself, set up your own benchmarks. So you need to check me on this. Because if you don't, I don't want you mad at me here in another month or two. And me and you have a falling out. Does that make sense? So as a manager, remember that. Then you go right back to your plan. Because as you're controlling, guess what happens? You didn't reevaluate your plan. Because what you're gonna look at your benchmarks and you're gonna say, listen, we didn't hit what we thought we was gonna hit, so guess what I gotta do? I gotta adjust my plan. If I adjust my plan, then I gotta possibly reorganize, you at least gotta look at it, right? If I reorganize, then I gotta go back down and relead and remotivate. We were doing X, but now we're doing Y, <laughs> and here's why. And then you go back to recontrol. So it's an never-ending cycle. You can't just make a good plan, and we've done this plenty of time, I'm sure. I've seen it in organizations, been guilty of it. Make a great plan, everybody agrees to it. We had a good meeting, clap, we put that plan on the shelf, and we go to work. We don't look at it again until we fail, and we go back and say, you know, we're all pointing fingers, it's too loud. Well, if you're a manager, it is, uh, you know, there it is. Uh, if you're a manager, then that's really what it boils down to. Uh, that's your job. So these are the four tasks of management in a nutshell. Plan, organize, lead, and control. Any questions, thoughts, or concerns? I can jump in anytime if you want to. So in planning, the managers didn't find select appropriate. Okay, I did it again, no problem. And I, I've done this slide for a long time. And I still do that because I get I like to talk throughout the slides. So I'll just hit these, but all this is right here is uh, what I just want to Except for that how to allocate resources. Do not forget about your resources. Everybody has it. On your own business, you got to know about that. But a lot of times we take over a new team and we forget about the resource side. I'll give you an example. You got a team and you're managing them and uh, you're now in charge of it and there's 10 of you and you get four new computers. Four new computers. This seems crazy. Think about this. You have four new computers, so four people are getting new computers. Is that a leadership challenge? Say all things are equal, right? So the computer does the same thing, everybody does the same work. Who gets the four new computers? The lowest person on the totem pole that's doing the most output. Yeah. Well, all those are good answers. It depends. It's your job as a manager to know and understand that. Will it affect your team? 
could it potentially be negative or positive? Absolutely. Both, absolutely. So, you know, you take it and you decide that I'm going to give it to uh, four people and you have your reasoning. But the perception is you gave it to your four friends. Drama, right? So these are the things. When I talk about management resources, I don't just talk about the, the, the uh, academic A's, B's, and C's of that. I know I've got this many and we got to use this. So you control the stuff that the people use. You control breaks. You control off time, schedules. We know what scheduling causes, right? So so-and-so got off during that time, and they know that's my anniversary. Every time this year, I'm off every single time. And then you said no, right? Right? Because I've heard, I've, heard, I've heard that one, right? And you're like, no, I didn't know. But boy, did I mess that up. Now, I can blame the person, right? Because I hear people, we, sometimes we're hard in management, right? We say, yeah, you know, we're in charge, and, you know, they ought to do this, and they ought to no, no, no. You don't, you don't pay me just to follow a rule book because then if you did that, you didn't have to pay me much money because anybody can read, can do that, right? You should be know this about resources. So that's one part I didn't miss on that. Resources are very crucial. Think about them in those terms of how they can do that. Seems simple, but all that drama that happens in an office is over stuff like that. If the manager has... Yeah. <laughs> hey. Yeah, I know you know it. Hey, now I've seen men. I mean, like even around here, like who gets the new mm-hmm. stuff when I was here and who gets what classroom to use uh, and that kind of thing. Oh, my goodness. I mean, seriously, it, 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 it goes all the way across boards, uh, uh, gender lines and everything else. So you have to put forth thought. We have to sit around and talk about these kind of things or at least think about it and put a plan together and realize though, that you control them. And, and in each situation, you figure it out. Y'all had some good answers and that means you're thinking. Uh, but each one you need to think about in this situation. So that's good. Organizing, we talked about how to group uh, lines of authority, best way to organize, uh, particularly mm-hmm. human beings, right? So the equipment is not hard to organize. The resources matter who gets what, but humans, you got to organize this. If you ever been on one of these things, we do this church at all times. We'll get to it in a minute. So y'all hopefully all go to church. If you don't, no judging. I'm just saying this happens at church, and I'm a church guy. So this is what we do at church, and it drives me crazy. They say, man, we need somebody to step up. We need a volunteer for such and such. Sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so raises her hand. I'm thinking, no, they're terrible at that. They're terrible. They sent, they sent this old dude down there to mess with the children, to handle help with the children. He had something to say. I mean, he's like seven, and he can't hear. And then he's hardcore. You know, he's straight out of the out of the, the, the dark ages of the, you know, beat your, kids. Just, yeah, beat your kids and stuff. <laughs> And these kids that we have, you know, they needed some discipline, right? Because they never had discipline. They but, him but, but we turn, we turn, yeah, we turn on the fire hose on and this guy. And he can't hear them, right? And he's yelling everything they think. It just wasn't a good thing. But he volunteered. Yeah, we set him up for that. Not good, right? But they asked for volunteer. Instead of, you know, when I have my talk, uh, in my particular church, I get to have a talk with the pastor because I'm the chairman of the deacon. So I get to say, hey, come here, man. <laughs> Give me, let me help you out. And uh, he gets the same same thing to me. I'm not perfect by stretch, but this management side, I hear help him. I say, hey man, let's let's not ask for uh, let's not ask for volunteers. Let's think about this and figure out who we think would be good at that for specific reasons, and then let's go ask them. Do you mind doing this? But when you say in a group and volunteers, right? <laughs> so when we're organizing, I've been part of those things. Who wants to do this? We get a team together. Happens in, you know, do that group work in college. Man, I hate that. I hate group work because I get beat on that deal, right? Because I'm that guy. I used to be an undergraduate, the guy, you know, that liked it because I would get over. But now I'm that guy that wanted the, uh, wants to do a grade and wants to do right. And people realize that and they're like, yeah, he'll do it. So who wants to do this? If nobody answers, it's going to be me, me, and me, right? So uh, that's, you need to organize, right? And to organize, think about it in the terms of this. Have a strategic thought in your brain about which way I want to go with people. That makes sense, right? So you say, this person's good at this. They have this particular skill set. Then you talk to them and ask them, would you be my enemies? Define why you wanted to do that. Again, not all in your book, not a principle, but just some of that things I learned. Careful with asking for volunteers. All right, leadership. What is leadership? What do y'all think it is? Give me on your own words. We know what the book says. I think you need that. In fact, there's the book. What do y'all think it is? Give me your own words. 
<laughs> All that, yeah. This about something good up right there. It does. See, here's how I say it. I mean, I'm shorter than that. I say it's getting people to do what you want them to do. Right? And you get, you're a leader. You get people to do what you want them to do. That's leading. Sometimes people say it's getting people to do what they don't want to do. I can see that. But me, for me as a leader, I want to get them to do what I want them to do. That means I'm leading. Now, as a leader, personally, I have to be very careful. When I say what I want them to do, if my goals do not line up with what the organization's goals is, then we have trouble and we are going to fail. So leaders do that sometimes. They have their own agenda. Me personally, I told y'all who I was at the start of this, uh, that I want to be known uh, as a man who loves God, who treated his family well, who worked hard. So I have to do that. This is why I do that. Not to say that because that sounds cool or to be impressive. I do that because when I make decisions as a leader for my family, which is far more important than what I do at work and everything else, and in life, what goals do I have? Right? So, so many times we go through life and we only lead at work. Now, I know people like this. They're excellent at, at work, but not so good at home. Yeah. You know, and um, because, and you know, I think about it, like, man, you know, I talk to them, you know, you don't have goals at home. You don't have an overarching who you want to be and where you want to go. You do at work, why wouldn't you do that at home? And I do that at home. So I have to, don't always do it. I certainly make mistakes. So I'm not preaching at all. I know this, though. As these life decisions and family decisions come, I base it off of that. You know, what does my God in Christ say for me to do? What is this best for my family? And I walk it down that to, to make that decision because it's my goals. Because if I do what I want to do as a leader, whether it's in work or at home, then we tend to fail. So when I say get people to do what I want to do, I'll caveat that in the leadership school of Stephen Hall is have an overarching goal <laughs> and understand that goal and apply it to that. And then you'll get to where you're going. It revolves around encouraging all employees to perform at a high level. True. Outcome of leadership is highly motivated and committed workforce. Yeah. I would say outcome of good and effective leadership is that. Right? You, we don't know. We have them leaders that don't get to that. All right. Expanded. What is leadership? Influences someone to willingly towards a predetermined objective. Right? To get them to go do that. We know that. All right. Yeah, I'll stop. And I'm going to get to 10 of them that I wrote down. So who's the greatest leaders of all time? Give me some examples. Give me a great leader. Jesus. She said Jesus. I agree she had to whisper, Jesus. We're a central Baptist, so you can say that. Yeah, <laughs> um, Not a central Arkansas. <laughs> let's see. Hitler was a great leader, if you think about it, just as a leader, not as on the broad spectrum, but as a leader. Yeah, he, he, he did. He did. Kennedy, yes. Hitler did some great things. In fact, he was on my list at one time because this was a list out of the book that was suggested that I modified it. I took him off, not because he's not a good leader. So I do agree with you. I took him off because I couldn't have him on the same list as my savior. I'm just that way. That man. Amen on that, my, my friend. Amen. Yeah, he was evil. So I, I just hate to see his name up there and giving him exactly. Credit. I hate giving him that credit, but yes. Yeah, absolutely. He mind controlled so many people. Absolutely. And, that's, and like that's what you gave as your example when he asked for such a thing about leaders and managers. You know, that's the example that you gave. Mm -hmm. you know, like Hitler, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's six. Who are? Are you going to? Are you going down to? Who you got? Who you got? Jesus, my grandfather, because he was my pastor when I was younger. My grandmama, my mom, my dad, and then that person. Yeah, That's good, though. That's good. Those are my greatest leaders all the time. No, they are. That's, I got okay. you. Anybody else? Did she yeah. say Martin Luther King? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Martin okay. Luther King. That was my greatest leaders all the time. Um, no, so I was my Kennedy. That's all right. <laughs> I go with Kennedy. I go with Emil Page. I go with Cleopatra. I also go with. Um, Did you say Cleopatra? Cleopatra. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You gotta read. That's the first time I've heard Cleopatra, but <laughs> I, I will not disagree with that one. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go out there, Bill Cosby. 
Yeah. Yeah. And he had a lot of family Reagan. for a while. Mm-hmm. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Yeah, Reagan. He's there. Even though he was Republican, but Democrats and Republicans all referred back to Reagan. Reagan. Yeah. Yeah. I That's got you, Reagan. That is true. All right. All good answers. Let's get to my list here. Opinion by right. Reagan. Save the country from pending economic failure. We were on the cusp of that. The trickle down economics we made fun of at the time worked. Credited for ending the Cold War. Uh, so we had this big, long going Cold War, and he broke the Soviet Union's back. And the Cold War, a lot of good things happened. Uh, since then, we've had a lot of wars, but that wasn't his fault. He did do that. It was good. Winston Churchill motivated citizens to resist the Nazis. Everybody else was wanting to capitulate and not fight and give in to Adolf Hitler. And this guy motivated folks and said, listen, we can fight. And that little island held out. They held out, and had they not done that, it would have been trouble for us because D-Day would have been possible if we were uh, sitting off from England, right? Didn't have England to go from if they would have dominated. So Winston Churchill did a lot. Of course, Martin Luther King. Now, I got him in here, and except for when I get to number one, I don't put these in any certain order. I am a personal, uh, my personal favorite of the whole list is Martin Luther King. I've always been a student of him and what he does it. I love his ideas and thoughts and what he does. So he risked and ultimately lost his life for a noble cause via civil disturbance. And he did something that I've seen no one else in the history uh, do, except possibly Gandhi, but, yeah, but he got people to give up power willingly on their own without overthrowing it. Everything else, when we have a power change, you have to ultimately overthrow that uh, power. He got people to understand that they're wrong. Now that's hard. That's leadership. To convince someone that you, what you're saying and doing, the way you were brought up, your culture, your way, sir, is wrong. So he had people to reflect and go, hey, that's wrong. Let's change that. That's, that's a good, powerful leader. George Washington. He got people. He led the American Revolution. Revolution. <laughs> he did display unusual bravery. Um, uh, even for that day, he just couldn't get shot in his, in, in, in the native Americans minds. They, they gave him a name because they didn't think he would die in battle. I mean, he like lost like almost all of his battles and he was up front and every one of them and people died everywhere. He still went and he got a revolution going. Right. So without him, chances are it might not happen. Abraham Lincoln, of course, he led the country through his darkest days. Also the emancipation proclamation, the time that he did it, and this is what most people miss, the time that he did it, he was losing support from his own party for the war because they were actually kind of losing that war because his generals were terrible. Uh, and old Robert Lee was whipping them. And he still went forward with the Emancipation Proclamation, which the people who were supporting him, his staunch supporters, did not care about whatsoever. So um, he showed moral courage and led us through it and turned out being the right thing. And then he died too early. I would like to think a lot of better things would have happened in the state. Of course, Muhammad Gandhi, terrible movie, uh, but great guy. They made it like four hour long movie. Resisted, or he didn't, they did the tyrannical rule of Britain. And then, of course, he did it through nonviolence. Right? So that was a good thing, especially in that culture he was in. So it's fairly violent. And he said, listen, don't try to withdraw him that way. Nelson Mandela. 30 years in jail on false charges, and he kept the faith, right? The entire time uh, ended apartheid, and through all of that, became the first Democratic elected president of South Africa. So that's pretty good. Otto von Bismarck led the unification of Germany in 1871. Germany was not a nation, it's a Prussian empire, and he led the unification of that and got them together and saw so they could see themselves as a country and became the first elected chancellor of Germany. Now, 40 years later, not so good. Old Hitler's boys took over, or actually before Hitler got there, that other party that he ended up, Shanghai, they come up to try to dominate the world, but Otto von Bismarck brought them together. It's good. Alexander Great, greatest military leader of all time. He just whooped everybody could beat everybody. It was amazing and known as a man who conquered the world. And I mean, when they called him that, they meant it. Like, he's like, great. And then he just died early. Probably his own people killed him. He forgot about the management. See, if he took this course, 
you might live a little bit longer. Because he wore some people out. Uh, military strategies are still used today, by the way. We still use what Alexander Great did and how he did business. This man, it's like, wow, first to do it, great. So, of course, Jesus of Nazareth knew he would eventually die for his faith and he's created, well, you know where we're at with Jesus, right? And all the stuff that he did, true believer. So there they are. Those are mine. And the books and some other people's. I Googled a lot of that. So all the things y'all said were good. I, I just agreed with the ones that the books had. And then, again, Hitler was in there one time. And I just like, he is a good leader. I just said that. Taking him off there. So, all right. Controlling. Control process is your ability to measure performance accurately and regulate organizational efficiency. In fact, as we talked about that. And you got to decide which goals to measure and how to measure them. Okay? That makes sense. So you need a controlling process. We'll get too deep into that because it depends on what organization you're running and what those control measures are. But if you don't have those control measures, we forget about those, then you can't make those course corrections. The idea is to make small, constant, one after another. It's like steering. Departments, so areas of management. These are just some general terms that we're going to use throughout the course. A department is a group of managers, employees who work together and possess similar skills or use the same knowledge, tools, or techniques. Um, the levels of management. Oh, things are broken up in departments. We call them different things in different organizations. Just know when we'll get this next chapter, but until about 1890, before industrialization happened, there was not such a thing because it wouldn't need so. So if you worked, worked and lived on a farm, everybody just did everything, right? I own the farm, you with me, we're together. Everybody had responsibility for everything. There's no departments. Industrialization really got us started down this track of turning things. So it's, this is a fairly new phenomenon. Levels of management, first line uh, managers. Uh, I almost said leaders, that's a military term. Middle managers, top managers, and CEO. Here's a key here. Who do you think has the least amount of training to do what they do on this chart? So yeah, well maybe, maybe. Here's me, I'm gonna reverse that. First line managers. Super low. Yeah. And, and, and I, this is a paper I wrote and this is my theory. So I'm gonna give you some of my theory on this. Some of the most important people you have is first line leaders because they're getting done what it is you wanna get done. They're all important, but I mean, think about that. That's the person who manages the people who do what it is that makes you you, right? So how do you, do you go to college to be a first line leader? Do you get training to be a first line leader? Usually, usually what you get is someone who is really good at their particular task and you make them the shift boss, right? You move them up into that position. And then we want them to manage people, but yet we have to train them. Typically, when you graduate from college and you got your nice new business degree or organizational management degree or whatever degree it is you have and you move into the world, guess where you start at? Middle management. Most people start at middle management. So if I'm going to go to work and be a, a department manager at uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, graduated college and they move me into that role, I'm not an executive yet. I'm not a top manager or executive, certainly not a CEO, but I'm entry level, but that's for a middle manager. Because I'm gonna have first line leaders over me, right? So here's an example: go to work at McDonald's. The shift boss, not the manager, but the shift leader, that still has to take orders but run other people's stuff. Probably got that position because of the work history. They knew the organization. They were good at it. They knew all the stuff that was happening. So I, I started on fries. I moved over to the window. I was able to handle some of the maintenance that made me a shift manager, right? But where's my training? Now, McDonald's is a bad example because they actually train those guys. But think about it in those terms, right? Uh, CSMs at uh, Walmart, customer service managers. That's your best checker. They can really check really fast and do really good, right? Might have changed by now. I used to work at Walmart a long time ago. But they, they studied our model. They have a CSM. They even call it the same thing we call our command our major. And they do a lot of that same job. But a lot of times, they can be really great, make you or break you with your checkers. But a lot of times, because they were really good, they got moved up, but they don't have good people skills, right? Happens all of the time in management. <laughs> bad people skills to get the job, yeah. Well, you know, see, but you say that, and, and that's why I say middle, first line managers. Now, for the life of me, that's why we need to train them. Because this is how you get that job, a foreman at a meal, right? 
see it all the time in an industrial world or at a, at a plant. When you become the foreman, the straw boss, the boss that, you know, it's not the suit wearing, but you're the boss of folks. You got that because you was the hardest worker or you had the best, th and you know, the most knowledge. You was best at your trade. That doesn't mean you're a good manager. It's a good that you know all that stuff and you want people to know that. Middle managers typically show up out of college. Some of them still got pimples on their face and a little tie on. They are your middle managers and they try to move up. Most people do not go to college and train to be a first round leader, right? Military, we got first line leaders and NCOs and stuff, so obviously we train for that. I'm talking about in the business world, we do not train, and that's where I got it from because I saw in the military how we train our first line leaders because as a leader, I rely on first line leaders more than anything. More than anything, I got to have them performing their job because typically a first line manager is, has done that job before and they're still responsible for someone for doing it, right? So um, I'll give you an example. Well, we'll get to that later on. That example. <laughs> we'll get to some of those but that then you get up to the CEO uh, depending on how they get their job and what they do a lot of times they're disconnected because they have a whole other skill set strategic planning or something else and they run top managers and middle managers you know a lot of times yeah or that happens or in tech world or, you know you're really good and you're proven to making a profit so they really don't care that you moved over from uh soft lines and at uh dillard's but you made them a profit and you turned them around they'll move you over to a tech company as a ceo because you've proven that you can work with managers and that kind of stuff you don't have to know you know what kind of shirts sell because that's not what you do you got other people to do it i would guess though those are really good at that can do that they understand how to train the first line leaders because if you look at the success of these companies that make it they have programs for a lot of their first line leaders their training that they send them to when you have a good successful hr program to so, train that's what I thought that, so what your question was what was your question that you asked them which one is the least trained and you said it's, it's the CEO. Is it the CEO? First lines. First line is the least mm -hmm. trained. CEO is probably going to be training what he does. He might not be training what that first line manager does, but you're probably not going to be the CEO if you're not sitting on some great qualifications. Right. I'm yeah, sure daddy owns <laughs> I'm thinking as far as, as in terms of a specific like job. Sure, absolutely. That's what I was looking at because yeah. I know, like in my terms of see, like you said, they may have went from dealers over to over a computer tech he may not have any knowledge over that over the computer tech stuff but yes. he just knows that he knows how to turn a profit right so he's not familiar with it he know how to look at numbers run numbers do sure. all these things so he's not even familiar with the lower stuff do. i mean he catches yeah he's going to be able to grasp the concept but he you know over time of working that type of business but he doesn't know anything of the business yeah. for real so like if he got if he moved down and tried to do what any one of them done before yeah. he got up to him then ceo he may, may not even be able to do that Probably not, kind of like that undercover boss show. Right. Like exactly. But so let me uh, should ask the question this way: Who is least trained at what they're supposed to be doing, okay. their particular task? Because the CEO knows what's. The I would pick that the middle manager. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because after the description of the first line manager, they've already been working in this and got promoted to that. Right. Whereas people, they go to school, get a degree, come mm -hmm. in as a middle manager. You just book smart. Right. And so in my in my in my in my what I do like for right now, like you know, I'm I'm customer I've been in customer service all my life, right? I know customer service. So my next thing to be would be to like move up to be will be like a supervisor or something like that. Well, I've done the customer service in my field, work it, know it, and, and everything like that. So I would move up to be a supervisor, which more kind of like like a middle manager. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if I moved up there, or if I came straight out of school with a degree or something, they may put me in as a supervisor or a middle manager, you know. But I've done the leg work to get up there in my position where I'm at. I've done the leg work. So that's why I, it's, I don't know. I just don't kind of really agree with that a uh, whole lot, you know. Because you think like you take somebody that has worked all their life and learned the company from the ground up, then they're not, they built their way up to the top, okay. you know. So let's think of this term. I got you, but we're talking about doing their job, right? That person's job. So who is the most trained and least trained at doing the job, the task they're asked? So the middle, the first line leader's task is going to be to manage people. So if you you can do it all day long, you can be in customer service, you can be uh, uh, flipping burgers, whatever it is you do, or working at Walmart. 
the CSM model and be the best checker there is, doesn't mean you know how to manage people. No. Right. Now, to be a middle manager, typically Walmart does this. They get you straight out with a college degree. Realizing you don't know a lot yet, that's why you're middle manager, not a top manager. And they're going to weed you out. Doesn't mean you're good at the other people's job. Doesn't mean you're effective. I'm talking about who's the most trained. Who's had the most training to do their job? We typically take a first-line leader, and we don't train them to do that. Right? Because we base it off of, typically, not always, we, but we... We base it off of your job performance, whereas you're completely what you're saying is you're right. A middle manager's there because he or she has a degree, but that means they have the training. That doesn't mean they're any good at it, right? They have the training. That's what I'm talking about, the training side. Oh, as a manager, realize that. So you graduate here and you become a middle manager. You go into that. You're going to know that. So you realize that you might be dealing, you might be 30 and they might be 45 or 50, right? Because you're a middle manager, right? But they've been doing this a lot longer realize that when they're not hitting your goals or not understanding these terms or getting it that away or realizing that you can't give out those resources that away is because they lack that kind of training. They've always thought in terms of how well can I do my job? And they might run circles around everybody in there and doing that particular job. But where was their training at? And typically, unless you go to McDonald's, which they actually do that, their shift leaders go to McDonald colleges, right? They actually have such a thing that teaches you how those things. And they teach some of these, well, they teach these principles there. So I typically you make fun of McDonald's all you want. I mean, they rip off not paying their employees enough. However, they're very efficient at what they do. Now, they wouldn't be selling billions of burgers and be the top company because they're very, very, well, I say efficient. They're efficient there too, but they're very effective at it. They can run other people out of it. Business, right? Because they're good at what they do, but they're trained to do that. You look at companies that fail, and they have a whole bunch of first line leaders, and you've been to those, you've been there, and they're not, like you said, you thought it was a qualification of CSMs to be that way, right? To not be people friendly. Honestly, that is because they have lacked any training. So that's the theory. I hear what you're saying. I think we're really close to saying the same thing. I got you. Some people, if we're just talking about terms of knowing the job or that kind of thing, but for the job that you're hired to do, which is to manage, which is to lead a first line manager, a lot of times the first line manager hasn't been trained. They're just picked we hire in at the mid-level management so many times. And if you go to a meal and talk to a bunch of old dudes who work in the meal, I'll tell you the same thing. Some foremans are good, some foremans are not. Uh, but what they all are good at is they're really good at their job that they did before that. That's where they moved them to. Because the highest you can go usually in the meal without a degree, being an engineer or coming in, you know, uh, from the degree plan is foreman. That's what you're working towards. Policeman, same way, right? So to be in the police world, they have the officers that, you know, tell them what to do and stuff, but then you have the phenomenon of the sergeant and those police officers that's been around a long time. They never took out of the track. Also in the business world, unlike in the government world, but in the police world too, it's very not rare at all to find a foreman, a shift leader, a policeman that's a shift leader or a sergeant who makes more than the supervisor. Mm -hmm. Because of all the stuff that you just said, all the value that they bring to the organization. The earning potential is higher for a middle manager because they can potential if they do good they can move up where that policeman that shift foreman that CSM is topped out but oftentimes because of their longevity and their knowledge they have it so yeah you see where I'm getting at with that does that make sense okay. now and that's not all encompassing you can have first line leaders like I said be trained and I thought about the training of uh, but good point uh, middle managers a lot of times come in and not know much We've all experienced that, right? When the manager comes in, new, like I said, got the little tie on, just out of college, got all these principles and ideas. Yeah, right, on those tasks and those kind of things. And then see, see where that's upside down, know where that goes to? Because if the first line, now, you might get some good training from that first line manager. He might or she might know what she's doing, but you got lucky if it wasn't deliberate, right? If you don't sit there and say, here's what I'm wanting to do in an organization. If I'm a middle manager, a top manager, a CEO, I want to ensure that all levels have the training to do what they do. You can have some middle managers come in, well, I got this degree in everything about mm -hmm. myself. Like a young lady I work with, she came in, she was to come in over me, but I, I hate to say it, I let you fail. Let you bump your head because you came in, I, I, I got this, I got my master. Working A is for a hundred. 
We're just off to the information system. You can even, you didn't even know how to get in the system. Mm -hmm. So it falls back to the first line manager. Mm -hmm. If they want, if if they willing to train you right, they'll train you right. If not, they can make you fail. Mm -hmm. Same way with the military. So I can come in because I went to uh when I went to space training, I had a spec four and metal line manager, might as well say spec four. Or we probably had to teach the spec four what to do. Mm -hmm. So either way it go, the first line manager is very key to the organization. Very key. So do and that's the really the takeaway is whether they get training or not, is ensure that they have it because they're key to that organization. Because they're the ones that are that next line. They're the ones ensuring that it gets your core competency of your company done. Whatever it is you do to make you you, right? Like what you do. If you're not managed well by your first line leader, it doesn't matter what that what that middle top or CEO does. Mm -hmm. Right? That's why you look at it. I'm glad we had a conversation about that at work today, but uh, yeah. Uh, you were like yeah. But yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And the reason I say it is because, like, for a while, the department I'm in, the federal department, we're very small, like, in Blue Cross. So it's only like the, type, the reps that we have, it's only like 13 of us. So we have the all of Arkansas and surrounding states, like, if they call and come here. So for a while, like, we didn't have like a, a supervisor for probably like maybe six months at the least. And we was running and doing everything, you know reports for you know the managers and all of the kind of stuff like a lot of stuff so then we had got a supervisor and she just oh uh, she still kind of lost it I mean, <laughs> I mean you know but she good she good she she's learning but she's been up for a while but <laughs> five years i think but she's still learning she's, she's still, still learning, learning. yeah well, so you, never, to... you never stop learning but you know you know, and I was asking her some questions today. She's gonna get mad at me in the meeting. I'm like, man, I'm trying to. I'm sorry. Let's get back to play. Well, that's fine. But that's you know what. A lot of that might come yeah. from. A lot of that might come from not defining those roles as to what what her responsibility is to do. One of the things I do when I take over in an organization because I get moving around a couple of years uh, in my old job and take over is I, I I try to relay that is here's my responsibilities. Get you the materials that you need to set your direction. If you if you come to work and you want to tell me which direction we're going, I'm not right. Direction is me. How do we do that? Is you? And then then you need someone to get you the resources. I let them know that up front that I gotta have that. Have I always done that? No, but I failed like that man. I just didn't get the luxury of sitting in a spot for five or six years. But I've learned that is define my relationship with the team that I'm on so they understand what my job is. So if I get you everything you need to do and you know which way you're going. Right, and I've done my job, and you agree to that, and I agree to that, and then we're good. We and we each deliver on that because that's the next thing. Cause we can say it all day long. We got to deliver on what we said. So you know that's that's a key is knowing and understand that. So I've been famous for my guys and letting them know in these organizations is is hey, what you just told me, and I've said this so many times right here, leading at this table in my meetings, and I have people tell me well intended. What we need to do is this, 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 and this. And I said, well, you know, you just, you're doing my job now. What we need to do in the direction we go, I actually get from a boss. I don't need to think of it on my own, but that's for me to tell y'all, right? That's me. How we do that, you can back me off every time I tell you how to do it. So if my job is to take that heel, and I tell you is to take that heel, you can't tell me, hey, sir, we don't need to take that heel. That's your job. Now, you want to tell me that's going to take three platoons and you're going to go straight with first platoon this way, you're going to flank with the last platoon. That's fine. That's your job to tell me that. You went straight military okay. on the day. Yeah, I did. <laughs> lost you, lost you, lost you. No, you didn't. But, but you see what I'm saying? I understood. I was like, yeah, I understand that. <laughs> the, 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 how to, the how to is is down below that first line or with no, that first line. Fine, yeah. So that first line leader is responsible for informing that middle manager of the how. And when I see organizations failing, this is what I see most of the time. And I get now to go and look at a lot of organizations, whether it's, I do, I'm also on the side, I do strategic planning for organizations and stuff for like churches and companies and stuff. I work with them and consult with them. And when I see the failing, that's literally what it boils down to, or in my own organizations or around here, I do that. 
is that right there is is they do not clearly define what you each level needs to do. And from what y'all just explained to me, y'all have experienced that because you're saying, you know, these people come in, they don't know what they're doing, right? If they're clearly defined, and they very well can be wrong and bad leaders, understand that. But at a minimum, they should be defined uh, at every point, what they're supposed to do, what you're supposed to do. And then I see it so many times, it's turned upside down. The person that's been there the longest decides, and I don't know why they do this, but you hit about 40, I got guys all the time that come in and they say, what we need to do is this. And I'm like, man, you're going to get the same check either way and you don't get to decide that. Nor do I, and it's not a, a power thing at all. We have a goal to meet. The mission, again, is the boss. As long as you understand that that mission is the boss, your job is to perform the task. But I do need you. You do bring value because you've been here a long time. You can tell me the best way to do it. But if you're telling me, again, not to take that heel, it just don't work out of way. Right? And your company will be the same way. And that's where you see that failure because people are that way. And I see it turn on head because the new manager comes in. They don't know what the heck they're talking about. The other person's been there a long time, right? They know, but then they start, and you've seen this, they start telling that middle manager what to do. One thing to train them on what they're doing, here's what I need to know about your job. What resources you need, overall what it is you're going to accomplish. Let's not get me on your keyboard. Let's not try to train me to do it your way right away. Because really it's a waste of both of our time because I don't have what makes you good at what you do besides your skills is the length of time that you've done. Now, how long do you think you're going to be there as a middle manager? Not that long. And if you really got a passion for it, then hang up the tie and go do what they do, right? I mean, and one job is not any more important than the other. In fact, in a lot of companies, and I appreciate this because we don't do this in the government at all because my dad was an NCO. So I understand. But we don't do this in, in the military, but in, 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 in the civilian world, they do you'll see many, many times longevity and what you bring to them being a first line leader or, or someone that's been there making more money than that new middle manager, right? So if you hire on in it, Blue Cross Blue Shield, I don't know how to do it, but I would bet you, you've got some people working there 20, 30 years, it's gonna have a higher salary than that new manager coming in based on their time, because it's the value that they bring, right? The value that they bring to the organization, uh, which makes sense. So it kind of tells you where you should be sitting at, but that doesn't, negate the job of the middle manager at all. And it doesn't negate uh, the fact that they need to understand what they're doing and another person needs to understand. So really that's where I see that crux is with those first line managers. And usually they're not wrong. In fact, they never blame down. If I see something broken in the organization, whichever part I'm looking at evaluating or consulting with, I look and start working my way up all the way to the, if they ever let me, I never got to a CEO, but I would tell the CEO the same thing. Hey CEO, that's your first sergeant that's in the first sergeant? Chief, 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 Chief. Possibly. I think the CEO, that chief executive officer, is going to be commander. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we're going to get on the military side. If it ain't, he's doing it wrong. Because what the first sergeant doesn't and shouldn't do, because they're really a, a souped up first line manager, is what a first sergeant is. What they don't do or shouldn't do is determine which way that company is going. That particular company and if they are we're wrong i mean no offense but that's that wouldn't be you're not gonna get where you need to get it comes back to the same thing only reason why that company commander is over is because of our rtc and went to school yes they yes. still have no understanding of what the first slide is five it's still the same thing they might not have i was an nco before i was an officer so I had some understanding, but not all were in that fact. I was enlisted. But what I'm saying is, it's not like enlisted to NCO, NCO to officer. Mm -hmm. So I'm just coming in straight officer and think they know they're enlisted, still got to train your officer. Yeah, I got it. And here's one last point on that whether it's this or in the civilian world, so we understand is if we are letting first line leaders determine what our goals are, right? Then you're not going to last very long. Not because first line leaders are dumb and don't know that, is they're not sitting where that CEO sits and doesn't have that same perspective of that whole thing. So direction starts working with the CEO, it's top down. How you do it, this is where the value of the first line leaders come in. This is where I need you and, and everybody needs to start a team, it's where their value is so great. The how to, so what we're talking about is two things, right? 
what you do and how you do it. So that company commander, if if you've had a company commander and you don't see him that much or her, and and you're seeing that first sergeant a lot, you've probably got a good company commander, to be honest with you, right? Unless there's some disciplinary issues or something they got to handle. Because what they're doing is they're staying in the what it is you do, and they're allowing and they're empowering that first sergeant, that platoon sergeant, to do their job. And and they're probably at some point listening on how, because they're not too worried. I'm not, and you mentioned this earlier, that term, micromanaging. So if you're seeing the top of that organization all the time, man, we're paying them way too much money and, and, and to do something else. I mean, that, we got that covered. You're right. First argument is absolutely should be covering all that stuff. But in the terms of a chief executive officer, what you do for a company, and that's why you can move from company to company now to understand their skill set, is to set their vision and where they want to go. So all you got to do if you're a CEO and they want to hire you for another company, this is the kind of questions they ask. They say, so where are you trying to get to? And if the company says, well, we, uh, we make computers, but we want to make cars and we want to outsell Honda, that CEO is probably not going to take that job. Because he's going to know you can't get that. <laughs> right? Not on my watch. But if they say something like, we make computers and we're losing profit right now and other companies are beating us and we want to get up above them, then he's going to say, well, what's your infrastructure? You know, what do you have? What's your assets? And when he adds up and he says, I see that you're underperforming. You have what you need, but you're underperforming. I'll take the job. And they sign a big contract and they take the job. And they don't have to understand much of that stuff they have to understand the strategic side of it and what it takes to get you there those are the differences in this pyramid now the unique thing is transitioning from middle to top to ceo how do you do that do you even want to do that right then first line so anyway we spent entirely enough time on this slide <laughs> we'll move on but good discussion i certainly appreciate that and give me some good thought about that that when i say training uh when i say training uh it's not the same thing y'all thinking of, right? Y'all are going to, actually the first line land leader, and I hear you, actually has more training than what they do. What I'm talking about is how to be a leader and that kind of training they have set to these classes. But I get your point, that's that's good to know. So maybe I reframe uh, how I do that one. I'm gonna ask that question, because that's a good one to have, or at least look at it that way. Conceptual skills, and that's what we were talking about is, this is the thing, you gotta have conceptual skills as a manager. That's be able to analyze and diagnose the situation and distinguish between cause and effect. So what's causing this and what is the effect? Manager has to do that. This is where managers fail a lot of times. We're just a victim of it happened and we don't know what to do. So that's important. Got to have human skills. You got to understand how to alter, lead, and control the behavior of other individuals and groups. And then this is what we were speaking about at length. You got to have your technical skills too. And the closer you get to the bottom of that uh, pyramid, the more technical skills you need to have within that arena, right? And I do agree that it's kind of crazy to hire someone on into a set just because they have a management degree or a business degree and they know nothing about your company, but yet then they're going to learn that. Um, we don't do a very good job in corporate America. We don't do a very good job, we don't do an okay job in military. We don't do a good job in corporate America. Like I said, what I was talking about is promoting from there. We stop a lot of times. You can look about any company and you can tell where you're going to stop at if you don't get a degree, right? Um, I think Denise, you mentioned it. Uh, your VP is retiring. Doesn't really matter all the skills or anything else that you have and how long you've been with the company. They're going to see that degree first, right? Companies seem to miss that sometimes. They want you to have a certain amount. So Absolutely. I've been in with the company 15 years and there's whenever my VP retires, the next person that takes over is going to want to see the degrees and even though i have over 120 hours i need the actual paper exactly so yeah they don't look at that part they look at that so yeah i now i think sometimes in the business world it's worth noting we miss that you know if we could promote from within and not have to have that degree uh, one of our case studies i think it's in this class maybe it's in the next one but walmart does that um walmart had a guy who didn't actually graduate and they end up making him the uh, head of communications for Walmart. So we're talking about a seven figure job, right? So what happened was this cat, he um, went to college, went to graduate, didn't have his last class, but you know, they let you walk, he walked. Then he got hired. 
And then they tell you, oops, you didn't have the required hours. You know, college dude is crazy. So he's like went to University of Virginia or something. Uh, the degree wasn't even in what he does, which is media and stuff. So he got hired on a company. Well, he never bothered telling the company because the company hired him to do this other job that had nothing to do with his degree, which was in media and stuff, right? So he was hired before he ever even walked. Well, he didn't get the degree, but he's already got a job, and it was a good job, so he never went back and got the other class. It didn't matter. He did really good at that. So they hired him at yet another company to lead their communication because he had a degree in something else. They didn't care because he did a good job. So they are like, yep, you're the man. Then Walmart hired him. He did really good at Walmart, and then they promoted him. So he went all the way up into Walmart, and they decided then that he's fixing to take over VP of communications for Walmart. Again, probably a million-dollar job, didn't say a salary. Well, you know, when you get jobs like that, there's a lot of haters. Somebody, oh, looked, somebody looked up and got mad and said, well, he even got a degree. Mm-hmm. And he's been lying this whole time. Eh, lying, it's mine. I mean, it never mattered. He didn't lie. He just assumed he had a degree. He walked. Um, you know, you're talking about 15 years ago, right? And he didn't get hired on that. Particular, his, his argument is, I didn't get hired on those skills anyway. And proof for the last 15 years, I'm like one of the most successful guys. So Walmart asked him about it. And what he did was he decided to step down from the position. He said, oh, ethically, I just, I won't take it if there's going to be a question about it. It made it easy on Walmart and went to another company. Oh, other company picked him up and said, I don't care if you have a degree or not. It's out of the open. We get one of your top guys. If Walmart's that stupid to let somebody walk away, it's actually that effective in what they do. Yeah, it's talking about that degree thing, right? The kind of stuff y'all were getting at. Right. That, but unfortunately, that happens in the business world. I, Walmart's usually smarter than that. Now, some people come across, well, he lied. And I, was, I don't know if he lied to Walmart. I don't know all the details. My point is, does it matter if this – Right. Junction, you, 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 you've you, earned you, it at this point. Right. You, you've done this, you know. But they have to have a degree to be at that level. They didn't want nobody. I'm like, well, wow. What does that piece of paper mean? You can go take that class. Right. A lot of people answer that away. But anyway, that's just a thing to look at. But that's just real in the business world. Hi. Ah, so we're here. <laughs> I don't know if I take the class. I've been like, yeah, I've been doing this for so long. Go to that class. Be like, look at me. You really want to make me sit in this class? <laughs> You just sign that A. Yes, sign that A. Yeah, it didn't really matter, but this asked which is most important. So, what's which is more important, conceptual, human, or technical skills? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, they're all important. Yeah, they all are, but you know. If I was hiring somebody and I had to pick one of those three, I got the technical guy, the human skill guys, and the conceptual guy, I would probably, I would probably lean towards the human skill guy. Cause. Well, yeah, it depends on what you're wanting to do and stuff. I mean, if, if you're, you know, it's like I said, if I'm hiring them to run my computer system, I really do not care if they got human skills or conceptual skills. Right. It depends on. So it all depends. It's, it's, that's really the thing. Just think about that, though, as a manager. Uh, your skills, which one are you good at? Which one do you need help in? And then think of that away is who can I put where to shore up my weaknesses or, or when I'm organizing that team, don't ask for that volunteer. Who's good at this? Who's good at that? Don't put that computer nerd out there dealing with the public, you know, and don't put me running your computer systems because <laughs> I don't care about details. I really don't. Details are just details to me. So anyway. All right. What's core competency? What's this? Yeah. What is it? <laughs> the competency of the court. That's one of those answers when you don't know the answer. Yeah. <laughs> a specific set of skills that allows an organization to outperform its competition. It is. It creates competitive advantage. What it is, it is, is who you are. It's what you do. Um, so, so what is Blue Cross Blue Shield's core competency? Uh, it would be more or less basically being able to compete with all the, all the different insurances that, that are out there. And I'm not just saying this because I'm in customer service, but to have the most top and elite customer service that you can have. Yeah. Because that's the front line. When you're dealing with insurances, whenever you have a problem or issue, the first thing that they're going to go to is they, that's their 
customer service. Our emails is correspondent. They send emails. Yeah, you're the first line of defense. You're the first company. line of defense. So their their core company is to be to excel. We just I just had a training on, on, on the customer service thing again. Like they do it. Like they didn't. I don't know how they train. They listen to see. That's the importance and the thing that they drive home. Y'all yeah. are the face of the company, basically. Yeah. Because that's who people are going to deal with. Your customer, the one who bring in our revenue. Core comps is that, and it's to provide insurance to people. And you right. cannot do that if they don't buy your insurance, right? Right. So you're out there. So that's a core competency of the company is that's what it is. So you wonder why, and I hear this all the time, and, and, and we got to this in the 80s and 90s, and then now it's reversed the trend, by the way. There's nothing wrong with information management at all. It's still very important. But I got a lot of buddies who do this for a living, and they get mad because they're not the core competency of the company. You've got to have information management to do your job. But again, it is the tail wagging the dog if the information management people are deciding which way you go. That's why you're getting put all that training and stuff. And then they're looking at their jobs being cut and their salaries being cut in the information management world. And here's the reason why. Because if I sell insurance for a living as a company, I got to have this other piece. And it's very important, but I also got to have human resources. I got to have payroll. I got to have maintenance. I got to have all this stuff. But what it is that I do that makes me me is my core competency. That is not the only job that's not just to support because you can't do without it. But that's where typically most of your effort is going to go. But that is at least who drives which direction you're going. So that's what a core competency is. It's who you are that makes you who you are. It doesn't matter if you work for the company and do something else. It is very good, especially as a manager, to understand what your core competency is. You want to find yourself out the door quickly, get crossway with their core competency and don't do good at it. Do good at it. So, so you can be really, 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 really good. I pick on the IT guys because I'm sitting in the cyber world now, but uh, and I deal with this. You can be really, really, really good at what you do in the computer world, but if it doesn't bring in revenue or the customers or it costs you more than the revenue you're bringing in, you fix it and be gone. You get cross with that and mess that up and don't make your system user friendly, then, you know, because that's what they're pushing. And that's always that, you know, when you harangue with the uh, supporting elements, they always try to. Sometimes, well, we need to do it this way. Well, if you're a manager, remember what your core competency is. If you have a say in it, you've got to lean to stay at it. And what it does, what you spoke to is create a competitive advantage. You, the core competency itself is, have, is providing insurance. How you get the competitive advantages from that is that first line of defense of being a better customer service rep. Why would I go to Blue Cross Blue Shield versus going to Affleck? Yeah, right. Both competitive price, you know, right. Up, so, so, so wh which one am I going to get the right? So how am I going to, you know, get that? You have a spa, you said. Mm -hmm. So why would I go to your spa over somebody else's? You want a competitive advantage. You want to, and and so you're thinking in, the, in that side. School districts, we work for the government, so you know sometimes we we lose sight. Not we personally, but they they do. That's why government gets such a bad name because we don't have to make a profit. So our core competency sometimes, like I know what the schools is, but sometimes we seem to get that. I see them talk about a bunch of other stuff at the school districts, and. My goodness, I'm like, but where does this help my child learn? <laughs> but we spend so much more time on that because they're not profit driven, so that hurts sometimes. So I just moved my daughter to a private school, Conway Christian, because she was going to Pulaski County here at Maumelle, Mel, and she moved up into the senior high. So I had the opportunity to put her in a better environment. It's a good school, it does okay. But the same thing, Pulaski County is now ran by the state, and the state has a different agenda. So when we talk to them mm. about things, their agenda. Their agenda really is what I call a self-looking ice cream cone is to stay in charge and never get a school board back where I don't have a say in it. Right. I'd really have a say for free because I think that's the American way. But since I'm paying money, I now have a say in other school because I'm paying money. So their, their, their core competency is a Christ-centered education, and they're going to stick to that because that's what I'm paying for. And if they don't do that, then people quit paying. So you get a little more responsiveness out of that. Um, my son – does not want to go to the uh, private school. And man, I'm not happy because of my pocketbook and I'm tired. Wow, I wish he'd go. I'm like, we'll let him go if he wants to go, but he's happy where he's at. And he's in middle school. And my daughter moved. She's iffy about moving. But the the environment for her and her demeanor, I thought, was better. So we had that opportunity. But I've learned very quickly by going and visiting with him and then visiting Pulaski County, which I get a bunch of rules and rule books and why you can't, can't do this in the state versus how may we help you? <laughs> yeah. 
my wife's like, they're so nice. I'm like, yes, because we're paying them a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, they're the chicken plant school. Yeah, they're the chicken plant school. Yeah, may I help you? So yeah, we're paying a premium, but that's, you know, that's just the way it is. So that's what core competency is. You need to understand what your organization's core competency is, especially if it's in the private world. Because if you start talking about messing with the company's private uh, profits, you'll find yourself crossed with the company very quickly. And that's, and then if you want to, you know, job security, try to stay in that core competency if you can. If you can't, that's okay and that's understandable. Again, my buddy's worked IT his whole life. He's got a couple masters in it and everything else. Was working for a, I won't name the company, so I don't want to bound them out. But what the company did is they laid off three rounds and he was in that third round. Problem is he'd been there long enough and it's not what they do for a living. That he, he supports it. They can't do it without his job. But everybody's graduating with this degree. They're paying him too much money. They laid him off. Rehired, but wouldn't let them rehire. Right? I mean, that's that's the bottom line. And they in in a three year time, three year period, they had a one hundred percent turnaround. They didn't lay them off one time because they went down. So they laid off the first group, brought in new guys. He had trained them off. Laid off the second group. I'm like, Eric, get your resume. No, I've been here this long. I'm valuable to them. Why do you think you just trained them other two people? The other two groups, third group got laid off, and they were the senior paid, and then they're right back into it. That group that's in there, the boy's gonna happen in five years because the pay's gonna you get those raises. Yeah. And they wouldn't let him hire back for it. That's how that happens. And that happens in business world all the time. So yeah. we say uh, we did yeah. some examples of poor competency. Restructuring, I just talked about that a little bit. Okay. Companies do this by simplifying, shrinking, or downsizing the lower operating costs. So that's really what I just got into, right? Companies restructure how they do business all the time. You know, I'm sure you've seen it in yours. Here's what it really means. I want you to do more for less. Really, the usual one doesn't happen. So this is what you'll see. So enterprise, they're being run carter. Enterprise, enterprise is good about this. Uh, they did this. This is how they do business. So you have that manager with that degree running that whole show, but they're also going to get you your car and hand you the keys and walk you out to it and do that walk around. Now there's two or three other people that are doing the exact same thing. This is how they restructure. They made sure that their managers also are an employee. So instead of having four people on and a manager, they just have four and the manager has to do the same work as everybody else. That's more for less, right? You see it in enterprise, you see it most rental car places. Enterprise is famous for it. So if you want to figure it out, they all dress the same, they all look alike, but ask and you see that one that's the manager, the little picture on the back. That particular person is running everything, but they have, they're actually, of course, they're not angry about it because they weren't part of it. They've been hired into that, but they made that conscious decision. Here's how we're going to cut costs. Every manager is also a worker. So I've had a manager because I have to deal with rental cars like all the time in my old job of traveling around. I have a manager take me in my car, walk me around and do that. Right. Now, they're also responsible for making the shift uh, rosters, who comes in and or the, the, the scheduling, I should say. Uh, they're responsible for all the things the manager's supposed to do. Right. I mean, running it and looking at the spreadsheets and the money and what they're bringing in. But they're in order in cars, but they're also... Uh, having to also do that work. But that's just a way of restructuring or lower or downsize the operate cost. Right. They realize the value of the manager. However, they don't want to just you to sit in the office and come out and make it run really smooth. They want you to work too. So that's just an example. These are old again, that's why I'm going to update the, which edition of the book we're on, but Dale and Nokia Xerox have all done so. I mean they're that's well passed and well studied. Do you have any other examples of downsizing or restructuring in a company? Can you think of any? You've done it recently. Pretty much just all the same over the continuation. Happens to Little Rock. We've got several companies just to go through. Yeah. Right, right. It's, it's, it's just what the military did do it back in 2000. Yeah, we're still doing it. We're yeah. still doing it. We still want more for less. Somewhere, hey, if you go ahead and retire, you can still so much in your retirement. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You know what your job is in the military because everybody's talking about how they're downsizing because of PT scores mm -hmm. and height and weight requirements. Mm -hmm. But if you, you have a critical MOS, they're like, nah, we're gonna waive that this time. Yeah, they they are and and, and they look at it. Here's here's their downsizing of it is uh, they start boarding us after my twenty years, you know, because I'm a twenty six year plus lieutenant colonel. You look at the, the difference between a, a twenty year lieutenant colonel and twenty six, it's quite a big difference in pay, but we do the same thing. So, you know, they start pressuring you. It's real easy for me to leave because I got an offer for another job uh, and I got my retirement set coming now. But yes, downsizing, all companies do that. My father-in-law worked at the uh, CrossFit paper mills 
Well, I'm from more across it down there. He worked there forever like everybody else, and they offered him a buyout, and they replaced him. Now, he turned it down the first two, but they did the same thing to him. So he grew up uh, in the board mill, which makes cardboard that makes your milk cartons. Uh, started off sweeping floors, worked up to foreman, worked all the way up to supervisor, worked all the way up to superintendent of that entire mill. He's got, at that point, that time, like 30-something years in that one mill. And that's what he managed, is that one particular mill. They come in, Koch brothers bought out Georgia Pacific, the Koch brothers, you hear them on the news, they bought them out. And they said, yeah, you're a superintendent of this mill, and there's three mills down there. They shut one down immediately, the plywood mill. There was four restructuring, so 800 people lost their job when Koch took over, Koch brothers. Uh, 800 people lost their job. Uh, and then they said, here's what we're going to do in the managers. We need y'all to go and you take buyouts because all you superintendents, because typically you have four superintendents per meal. If you have four, that means you got three shifts at eight hours and you got the floater. He's not a floater, but that way you get off time, right? How that works. And then each meal, each three meals at that time, four pickles, and now each three meals had those four people, right? So three times four is 12 superintendents at about $80,000 a clip. Right, it's about what he's making. It was pretty good for a high school diploma, but worked his whole life and worked his way up to there. They were the unique company that allowed you to work all the way up to the, pretty much the top as a superintendent. So Coke came in and said, all right, so in any given time, uh, three superintendents were on, and you had a photo. So the first thing they did, they took the, they offered three of them to go home and paid them. They said, we're gonna do this with less. We're gonna have three per meal. So you don't have that photo where you're getting off time. Well, that messed with everybody's off time, and you're always having to, there's never no time to have a break. You, you know, get you time. Yeah, you then they turned around and they said, here's the next thing we're going to do. We're going to cut the other two-thirds of you, and we're going to make it where one superintendent's on for the whole meal of the whole time. You know, my father-in-law says, well, no, because he stayed through the other and missed his near season and stayed. When he did that, he said, I can't do that because I don't know anything about the other two meals. I'm like, well, it's, it's leading. I talked to him. It's the same thing. Just go in there and lead and do the same thing. He said, oh, I've worked. 30 something years in this one meal. I don't even know how to get to the meal. It's over here, but I mean, I don't even think about it. But that's what they did. So that was a restructuring downsizing. Well, it worried them so much when he took the buyout, they all did. And then guess who they got now? New guys that haven't worked in that meal at a lot less price, right? So if you're 20 or 30 years old, you work for a lot less than the guy's 50s got family and, and a lifestyle that he's used to. So they got in cheaper just with the restructuring and they got them to where they need to get. That's the Coke brothers. That's what they did. I'm not saying anything good, bad. Companies do that. That's that's downsizing or restructuring in a nutshell. And uh, they did that. And that's how they do that at other places. Outsourcing is contracting another company to perform work activity. You know who the biggest outsourcer is now in their jobs? AT&T? No. No. Nope. United States government. Oh. <laughs> Anybody oh, been yeah. to Iraq? Yeah. Been to Afghanistan? You been anywhere? We don't even cook ourselves anymore. We do it AT and stuff. I'm talking about when you deploy and everything else. But the government, if you're not pulling the trigger, basically, if you're not a soldier in, in that way, we have outsourced everything. Yeah, you don't have meals, our maintenance, everything, our logistics, everything is outsourced now at this point. Why? Costs a little bit more because, all right, so to retire, everybody says, Oh, Hall, oh, you're retiring. You'll be a contractor out here. The contractors do pay pretty good. I can make, I can make some big money. It's good for us retirees because contracts come and go. But if you already got a retirement, you say you just take the contract. I still got young kids in school, as I mentioned. I like stability. So I took a job that offers some more stability for me over the contracting, even though I might pay more because I, I, I like to have that stability. I'm used to that. But the reason they do that is because we can cut you as contractors in the government. So when the money runs out, it's easy. Really can't cut a Department of Army civilian or a uh, civilian that's a, a federal employee because they have rights. You can't cut a soldier because they're on a contract. Yeah, right. So, And then the government realizes that I'm a bad investment. So for 20-something years, they use me. Now I retire. I'm 43. The average lifespan is like 73 for a male today in this country, 73, 74. So they're going, they paid me for 20 years of active duty. Now they're going to pay me 30 more years in a retirement with full benefits too. I get medical and everything. It's a nice way to go. So it's easier than investing into all these soldiers to do that, just to have a contractor. So when you're tired of them, 
they're gone and you don't owe them any benefits. That's why we're outsourcing in the government. Uh, they're they're a huge outsourcer. And that's something people don't realize. So when these budgets get affected and we have the continuing resolutions and that kind of things, you see it. They always show the soldiers and our pay kind of gets almost talked about getting interrupted and everything. Unfortunately, what the news don't report on is that look how many contractors just got laid off and they don't get paid for those months. Right? That's what happens. So today, very bad day for me today, but I had to let seven contractors go. Seven. Because they said one October New Year money's coming and we're going to divest of their services. Now their contract is good through March, so I felt better. But they don't realize how fortunate I didn't get to go through March. That was a fight. But these seven now are having to find another job. We don't have to owe them anything. That's why you outsource. And they all been green suitors. In my department, there was, you know, uh, 11 of us. And seven of them were contractors. And they do all the work. So they don't let them go. And they're going to pick them up a new contract in a few months when the money comes. We're going to pick them up cheaper. That's outsourcing. So, uh, Usually low cost country abroad. That's one of the books old a little bit. Three million jobs have moved since 2000. It has more than that now. Dell has, and y'all mentioned it in at and They got people that's employed 12,000 in because it's cheaper. So that's important. Very important thing that the book talks about, but I'm talking now today, companies are doing it in other ways too. So they don't have to pay you benefits because people are hurting for jobs. So they'll just go out and bring you on contract. The veterans administration, my buddy who lost his job at that other company, is now working for the Veteran Administration as a contractor. So he's doing good, making okay money, but he doesn't have the stability. They will cut that contract anytime. And I had to explain to him in the government year, which I start in October, so be careful because when we cross that FY, you're probably off for two or three months because the contracts don't get paid. They'll always pay the soldiers. They act like they're not going to pay us. They do because that's a big political thing. And that's good. I'm glad they do. But they did miss them as well. You didn't have drill, yeah. We cut a whole drill out, right? Yeah. I don't get into why we did that. It wasn't Arkansas's fault, though. Yeah, it was Texas's fault, by the way. They broke the bank. They overspent. So they had to go back to Garbiro, and they overspent like about 35, 40 million. They did. So Garbiro had to bail them out, and the only way they could get the money was to cut out an entire drill. Anyway, we didn't know that. <laughs> so uh, empowerment, what's, what, what, what's empowerment? Um, knowledge, I knowledge. Knowledge. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. It does. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Go look at it. Well, I won't get into that. Uh, giving employees the more authority and responsibility over the way to perform their work activities. Yeah. Free to go or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's opposite of uh micromanaging. Mm -hmm. Right. So allowing them to make decisions and choices to be basically a self manager. Right. And make sound decisions, you know. So my job as a manager of you would be if you're doing I'm talking about customer service and then they're right. sitting there, if we use the management to tell you how to do your job, that's kind of a waste. You should know better than anybody. My job really as a manager is to provide you the resources to do your job. Take your feedback so you can say, you know what, the customers are saying this, right? Mm -hmm. And then you tell me, then I work it and go get it because I have the ability to move around more than you stuck at a, wherever you're at doing that. That's empowerment versus, hey, did you call that customer back today? Did you do this? And you're like, man, yes, that's what I do every day. Or no, I didn't call them back because I don't have to because that's not what I do. You almost sound like you don't know. Yeah. So, 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 so if they empower it, so empowerment's good, micromanage is bad, right? We, ought, we can say that, we can define it. The, the trick is, the art of that is to ensure that you do it. Man, it's easy to say. It is hard to do, though, when you're that manager and you just don't trust them people to do their job, right? Because your job's on the line, and what if they mess up? I hear it all the time. I try to push empowerment down, and I got people under me working with the folks down there, and they tell me that. And I'm like, man, quit, quit, back off, because I'm dealing with, like, captains and majors and stuff. Okay, back off and empower them to do their job. Trust and see. And they're like, well. And they're like, you're going to yell, yeah. You're going to yell at me. <laughs> yeah, you're talking about the ultimate middle manager, right? Yeah, because here's the thing. They're in charge of nothing. Right? I was a major for a long time, so I know. And I used to hate majors too because they mess with captain when I was a captain. But anyway, it's a middle management position. They don't, they're not commanders. They're not charging anything. But 
if that doesn't happen, that's who I yell at, right? So, you know, that's who I get to yell at. So they're like running around, micromanaging. I'm like, don't do that. Yep, it just rolls. So here we talked about um, building blocks. We talked about competitive advantage. Here's the building blocks. All right. So the book says efficiency, and I agree with that, and it does create towards a, 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 a competitive advantage. But overall, a competitive advantage is effectiveness. Does that make sense? We can just replace competitive advantage with being effective if effectiveness speaks towards you getting your goals, right? If your goal is to be to gain a competitive advantage, that's where effectiveness would come in. So that's why those terms are completely different. You don't see it here. So efficiency, got to be innovative, right? You know that as a own business owner, right? You, you got to stay up with the latest stuff. If you don't get the newest, whatever that y'all do in the world, because I don't go to spas. But if you don't do that right, my wife doesn't come. So, because she goes. So you want to do those kind of <laughs> things, right? Well, she, I mean, she's a spa person. I'm not a spa person. But, you know, they want that latest whatever it is, if you don't yeah. get that, right? So you got to stay ahead and be innovative, right? Uh, responsive to your customers. If you're not very responsive, they tell you, you know, we want this service and you don't give that service, you probably I'm lose them. Next thing is, you gotta have quality. You heard, our, you, you did what I asked you to do, you got this, but you're just terrible at it. Well, you don't wanna come back to that, right? And of course, you gotta be efficient in all your practices, right? Uh, if you're not efficient in that, then you're just wasting time, energy, and money, so it's hard to make a profit. So you're really good at what you do, customers love you, and we've seen those companies. They have a, you ever watched Shark Tank and they run the numbers? Huh? Yes, love it. Love it. So here's what they're doing, right? We could just watch this show like and do this class sometimes. Uh, they're running those numbers. And those people are successful. They're on there, a lot of them. They're like, they got this. But they go, here's what they're looking at. And they're at the CEO level. They're thinking, where's my profit at? Yeah. So you're not very dead gum efficient is what they're telling them without saying that. They say, I got a problem. You're really good. You got all these customers, but you're not making any money. So I'm going to give you a million dollars or 500,000, but you're still not going to make any more money because it doesn't change the fact that you're not running efficiently. Why do they think they want a certain amount of control? So they can get that efficiency down because they know it, right? you got innovation. You're responsive to your customer. And obviously, you got quality. You wouldn't be standing in front of me, but you're not efficient. So you can be very, very good at what you do and make zero money. Take that with you. There you go. There you go. You have that. There you go. And show them that and say this. And here's where I am. Here's yeah, my efficiency. They just give you the money in. They want to make <laughs> Just give you the money and go. Yeah. Well, I hope you make it on there. All right. We're going to skip that. Everybody can take about a three minute break. I'm going to pull up the next set of slides, okay? Because we're getting late and I don't want to keep you much longer than I have to. That's uh oh. Did I lose connectivity? Yeah, looks like I did. No, I'm still on. No, I'm not. This system here. Well, it's on. So why can't I bring up chapter two? And back to web study. No, I don't want that. So let's pull in my materials. Web study materials. Reconnect.
And Denise, let's see, let's get that off of there. So as we're connecting. Nothing's going up there with my fucking life with my sister. Log out. I don't want chapter one cancel. That's the problem. Let's go. I'm so sorry for good. I'm talking about it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. All right. Good news and bad news. Good news is I was able to get chapter two up because it's on my hard drive. Bad news is because the way the system works here, we're not going to get to the file drive where chapter three is. But I can't get to chapter three. We won't go to chapter three tonight. But we're almost out of time anyway, so we'll we'll speed through two. You'll see three online to see it. That's good. Okay. We'll get an hour. But it's gonna take me an hour to get through this one. <laughs> so, uh, but it's still be online in there. So, the evolution of management thought is what we're gonna talk about. Uh, of management thought. So, really, what we're gonna talk about in this chapter is uh, how we got to where we got to have this book and how we see things. Key to want you to remember is when we talk about the first way they did business, the second way, third way, fourth way. One just really took off of the other, it took off the other and improved upon it. So the first guy that defined this did not get it all right, but he didn't get it wrong. The principles still stand. So it's key to know and we work our way up to where we're at today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, and you'll have to see this annoying little um, picture in the front of that speaker. That's where you're supposed to point and hit my voice. That's the technical difficulty I had, that's not working. That was what's on my hard drive right now, so that's just going to be on these slides for now, but that'll all be fixed by in the morning. So I apologize for that. So 1890s is when they started looking at the scientific management theory. Why? Because, again, all the way up until like from Jesus' time to about 1890s, you had lords and serfs. In America, we used to have landowners and people that worked on the land. But lords and serfs, basically, if you owned a farm, you owned the land, you as the boss and you did everything, you didn't do everything. You just charge everything and you had no middle managers, you didn't have any of that mess. What you had was people that 
because of who they were and born into that were there, right? So that's just the way it was. So um, there was no reason to have middle managers or any theory of thought because there's no industrialization. Industrialization. We were working on the farm. So, you know, you had to go get milk and chickens and eggs and do the things you do to live on a farm to live, right? That's how people existed. Uh, the 1800s to 1890s, early 1800s, they started making factories. And in factories, they had people that they would make the boss because they owned the factory and they had a son or something like that. And they put them in charge and they had a bunch of workers and there was nothing in between and no thought of it. So by about 1890, they started thinking about that. How can my factory be better than your factory? Well, I can quit acting like I own land and putting people in charge just because of who their last name is or where they're born into. Does that make sense? Or their social status. So they said, let's study this. You know, I can hire managers. The next, they went to administrative management theory. Administrative management theory is uh, that's where they, well, scientific, they looked at just the nuts and bolts of it. If you're going to do this, you need a manager. You need to have departments. We talked about departments earlier. We need to break this down into logical sequences. We can't have the same person building everything because that's what they originally did in the factory. They said, we're going to specialize on our task. So if you have one person putting the wheels on the car, one doing the steering wheel, one putting the engine in, the assembly line was invented, that kind of stuff, scientific. Administrative theory, they said, well, we also got to have some managers out there that understand hierarchy and rules and regulations. So they added a layer to it. And then there was a lady, and she come up and she said, about the same time as all this other stuff, 1890s, 1900s, she said, yeah, that's all good stuff, but you forgot about the people. People react differently to different situations, and they have bad days, and they have good days, and they'll be more productive on how it is we interact with them. Irony is, guess what they did? It's 1890, 1900, 1920, 1930. Guess what people weren't? Fair. They didn't listen to her. Probably because she's a woman, right? To be honest with you. They probably just said, you don't know nothing. And they had these good theories. Well, about 1960, well, before that, 40s, they realized something. And they said, actually, you know what? How we interact with people, how we interact with people determines how they do. And then somebody said, oh, remember our old girl? She came up with this. You just didn't give her credit for it. That's why that Behavioral management goes way back there. But we didn't actually use behavioral management early on, even though she defined it very well. And then they come up with the management science theory on top of that. And then they come up with the organization, organizational environment. And, and that's really where we're at. And they all just started building on one another, except for the exclusion of, oops, we forgot about this lady. So, but history now remembers. Unfortunately, she didn't get to see the fruits of her labor. And we'll get into who she was in a minute. So job specialization came on, right? We uh, moved off the farm, moved into the factory, and said, look, it's more efficient if somebody, if somebody will do one job. They spoke to efficiency. And that's the first couple of theories. It really speaks to efficiency. It ain't until after behavior management that we get into that other scientific management that just says it backwards. We talk about effectiveness, right? They realized, oh, y'all are really efficient. You ever seen the movie Cheaper by the Dozen? Understand the concept Bilko, of it, Sergeant Bilko. Yeah. Sergeant. Oh, would you say? Sandra Bullock, I think. Oh, Sandra Bullock. Oh, she might be. Oh, no, no. that might not be the same. Uh, what's his name? The guy that played Sergeant Bilko. So I thought you were saying. Oh, Steve Martin plays it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I seen that. Yeah, I seen that. But that's that guy who is based off that book. He has twelve kids and he's efficient yeah. in everything. So every kid has to do something really efficient. And he'd walk into a factory and say, "You are not as efficient as you can be," and he would read. Director, he time everybody, time study management, he time what they do, and he make them quicker and better what they do. That's the 1930s and 40s thing. Now companies are kicking other companies' tails because everybody's figured that out, right? We're really efficient at what we do. Now we're figuring out what plays to use, right? What strategies to use, right? It's a little football analogy, right? So we all got good at the X's and O's. We all learned in football you have to work out, got to be strong, you got to be fast, you got to be accurate, all that. Get to the pros, everybody's like that. So now we've got to change the strategy up. So as we get further, that's what they started doing. They said, listen, we've got to have goals and that kind of stuff. So that's really what this is. So we started off, though, with job specialization. F.W. Taylor, he said science, uh, scientific management, a systematic study of relationships between people and tasks for the purpose of redesigning the work process to increase efficiency. That's all he's saying is, you know, you're supposed to do this, and if you do it this way, you'll be more efficient at it. 
His research continued with Frank and Lily and Gilbert. Then somebody come along and said, yeah, that's great. This is what you forgot about. The study of how to create an organizational structure and control systems that leads to high efficiency and effectiveness. So the guy come along and said, yes, you're very efficient at the individual level, but how do you create a structure that helps you, right? So you, you concentrated on the guy that, that, that puts the widgets on every day, but you didn't, you didn't concentrate on the manager. How does he become, or makes that become more efficient, that organization? Oh, well, Max Weber said, you gotta have bureaucracy to do that. His goal is to ensure efficiency and effectiveness. We'll look at the next slide, another one of those charts. But he said it, it's what you gotta have. All these companies, you gotta have a system of written rules and standard operating procedures that specify how you should behave as an employee. You gotta clearly specify the hierarchy. You work for me, I work for this guy, and these are your rules. Next, you have selection and evaluation system that rewards empl employees fairly and equitably. So if you do a good job, I give you this, equal pay for equal work, right? He said, you gotta do that, because now, quite frankly, in 1990, 1900, that was a very foreign concept, right? We paid you based on your social status, not the work that you did. So while this sounds very draconian and, and very rules oriented, he's like a mean guy, this was like a liberal at that day, because he's saying, I'm gonna give you rules and tell you how to do stuff, so it means I have to do something. Right, so I, I know you need to know what you need to do, and we'll give you that authority. I, I'm gonna explain the hierarchy authority. Plus, I'm gonna pay you for what you do, and I'm gonna base it off of what you do and not who you are. Big difference. And then clearly specify the system of task and role relationship. So very important, very innovative. Today it seems like pretty elementary, and you would see this guy again as a staunch guy that is just writing a bunch of rules. But you gotta remember, this time, it really, we had a class system set up. So if you were really, really good at what you did, but you were not that wealthy aristocrat, you didn't get paid wealthy aristocrat money. It didn't matter. You didn't have time for that. To, they didn't see why we paid for that. So he said you got to do that to be efficient. Guess what happened? Industrialization hit. And this is where Henry Ford, uh, those guys in the steel mills that you hear about, the captains of industry, this is where they come along. These guys weren't born into it. And they took these theories and they decided that, hey, what we'll do is we'll pay people and we'll be better at it. And that's what happened. But these are the rules. That's formal written standard operating procedures. That's a specific set of instructions. So we know our rules are right. That's the, the little book that tells you what you can and can't do and what you're supposed to do. Standard operating procedure tells you how to do what you are supposed to do. Right. So you have standard operating procedure. If I call in and say, I got an insurance claim or I got a problem, you got a standard operating procedure, right? Hey, Mr. Hall, this is verified yeah. and, you know, verify their information and make sure you understand what the issue is and then go to fixing that to see, you know, the problem. And that's where the art comes in for your job because you live here and you understand that and you understand how to do that in a personal manner, I would imagine. You've done this before. You call over on your computer and you get that guy from India and he's on that script because he has standard operating procedure. Thank you, Mr. Hall, for calling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he goes, thank you, Mr. Hall, for that call. And then you say something. Yes, sir, Mr. Hall, thank you for that. Uh, you know, he has to say that same line. Oh, I'm sorry that you had that problem. You know, instead of just getting it, they don't get it. Right. So if I call you and you understand, and yeah, you get what I'm saying that I need this, you don't, you know the standard operating procedure, but you don't have to say every little word. They're reading that SOP like it's a rule book, right? <laughs> So yeah. here we get this. You got rules, but you don't read me the rule book when I call you and I want this. If you right. can give me that without reading the rules, you just go through your procedures and you get it to me, right? right? Uh, or if you don't, you tell me why, and you, then you can refer me to a rule book. That's how that goes. Next is norms. Uh, norms are the unwritten and formal codes uh, of conduct that uh, prescribe how people should act in particular situations. Every work has norms, right? So how you dress, what you get to talk about, what you get to do, how things are seen. Right, all that is your norms that your company gets to do. As a manager, understand all three of those and how they interrelate. Do not forget about norms and understand those norms that are in there. Y'all mentioned that new person comes in, they don't know anything. Most of the time, they're really guilty of breaking your norms, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they, 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 they pulled out that rule book and said, breaks are supposed to be 10 minutes, and the norm is we take 15 to 20, <laughs> right? If that's the norm and you're a manager, and you've inherited that, there's no need going back to that rule and making it 10. Right, right. Right, because all you're going to do is tick the, 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 the workers off, and they're going to be like, why does it think they don't know nothing? And you're like, well, because the rule says this. 
well, you have norms and you need to understand. And it ain't just about that. It's, it's, it's all the other right. ones out there, how to deal with people. All right, the FAO came along, principles of management. We still study these today. See table 2.1, I won't go into them, but look at them. These 14 are very important. When you read these, for your military folks, you've seen some of this before. We copied it. So uh, they, they increase management and finish, you see. Note the terms in blue words. All right, here she is, the unsung hero, Mary Parker Follett. And had I not had this book in my master's course, I would not have never known anything about her. Had not teach this class, a lot of people wouldn't know anything about her. So I appreciate Jones and George here giving credit where credit's due. She's the one that came along and said, hey, Taylor, I got it, but you didn't talk about the human side of the organization. So you're making people more efficient, but really, if they're having a bad day and they got a life, they'll be less efficient. If they're having a good day, they'll be more efficient. If you treat them right and let them have the 15 minute break, because that's our norm versus the 10, they'll act better. She said human behavior has a lot to do with it. Unfortunately, iron, ironically, <laughs> the person talking about that, we had bad human behavior at that time as a society and they didn't listen to it. So she suggested, look at this, workers help in analyzing their jobs. So how about you tell me what it takes for you to be successful at your job versus me, Mr. Know-it-all that's never done this job, tell you how to do that. She said it would be cool if that person has done this job, tell me the best way to do it. And then I provide them the necessary resources. So I've said this about six times, not because it's important, not because it's on a test, but because I feel in management this is important. All right, that won't be on the test. I'll let you know what's on the test. This is important because this is what I want to impart is you need to listen to what she said if, if people do that. Right. In the right in aspect, any field, you know, any field journey. Yeah, yeah, that's in the field. Oh, that's different. I mean, like she said, if you want your company to be successful, then yeah, you need to listen to your. You got a whole business. bunch of experts already working. They all just say they're going to go on strike and walk off one day. Everybody agree. Yeah. That business being shut yeah. down for two or three days, that's going to that's gonna hit them hard. Yeah, and guess who loses their job out of that? So, Typically, the workers get to go back, even if they lose their job. Let me tell you who never survives a strike. Middle management. <laughs> We're going to get rid of you, <laughs> right? Because your job is to prevent that from happening. I mean, that is your job. Middle management does not survive those types of situations you talked about. So why do they lead to them so many times, right? And that disconnect. Sometimes it's up that causes it. But if you work with that organization, start getting your resume dusted off if people are striking on you because – that's who they're going to get rid of. And they might get rid if they can, the companies usually will get rid of the workers too and replace them, but middle management does not survive. So if workers have relevant knowledge of the task, they should control the task. So instead of me telling you how to write that SOP, so go back to it. I can write some rules. The company can write some rules. I can enforce those rules. But the SOP, really, should I be writing that? Should I be setting the norms? Uh, if you have relevant knowledge of the task, then you should really control those things, right? As long as you're hitting what I asked the, the outcome to be, which is like, you know, like good customer service, then we're good to go. So, yeah. or whatever it is your particular job is. That's how that goes. All right. She was mostly ignored at the time. They said, yeah, whatever. You know, we don't care. We're not listening to you. We got all this other stuff. So then what happened was, did y'all read in the book about the Hawthorne effect? Mm -hmm. Read this one. If y did y'all read it? It's awesome. So the finding that a manager's behavior or leadership approach can affect workers' level performance. So for the purpose of the class, I'll go over it real quickly. Uh, they were studying efficiency in a factory making light bulbs or something, uh, all female factory, and they wanted to make them more efficient. So they played all kinds of tricks on them. They would lower the lights, they would lower the temperature, brighten the lights, raise the temperature, give longer breaks, give shorter breaks, and they were there constantly with their clipboard for four years and they're taking it down. This makes you more efficient, this makes you less efficient. They're trying to get everything just right. So how much energy does it cost? If I can if I can lower the light, you know, this is crazy, but this is how you think, you wanna make money, you'll take a bit of advantage. If I can lower the lights to this extent where it doesn't affect your behavior, and I save this much money and I've got it more capital. So all the way to those kind of things. They've looked at everything, for what they could wear, how many breaks they could take, how they could do it, and put them through all of this. And they never knew that they were going through this. And then they got to, formulating their results and the cool thing is they realized is when we're there with the clipboard they're more efficient they drew all these other charts and looked at all these variables but really people were more efficient when they were there so if people are there watching you and they got a clipboard you're just going to act different it's kind of like when they put a camera on you some people start smiling and doing this other people start running they act a little bit different when people are there 
So, so it tells you this, and this is why we have this class today, and this is why I'm glad it's here because we're managers, is management matters. My term, I use it this way. My motto is leadership matters. Leadership matters. You get that in my leadership course. It absolutely matters. You can't just ignore that position. If you do it wrong, you will make people less effective. If you do it right, you will make them more effective. That's what old Follett was saying. How you interact with your people matters. And they go, oh, forget about that touchy-feely stuff. But then they proved it themselves. So they kept going after this thinking efficiency. And they said it was in the Hawthorne factory that they were doing it at. So they called it the Hawthorne effect. It is really what Follett said 40 years earlier. So they realized, man, if we just treat our people like people, we'll probably get more out of them. If we show up and interact and figure out, and, and she says, well, take it a step further, ask them how to do their job a little bit better. And everybody, all those ladies have been doing this same job, and they're working like those 12 hour shifts, you know what I'm saying? Six, seven days a week, sitting there at that same place over and over. I mean, they were just working to death. If you ask them, they could probably tell you how to be even better at it. Unfortunately, this is in the 40s or 50s. <laughs> they didn't, they said, yeah, 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 we hear you, but no. We, we know that we got to interact better with them, but we're not going to, we're not getting, we're not there yet. We're not asking the people how to better do their job. So they didn't quite get everything she said. So that leads us to the next theory, which is X and Y. You ever heard these before? All right. So as a manager, we can make this black and white. You want to probably operate in Y. Some people operate in X. Reality is it just kind of depends and kind of go back and forth. But this is kind of your lens that you see things through. Think of this way. This is my outlook of how I make my decisions, these two theories. So X is the average employee is lazy, dislikes work, and will try to do as little as possible. Therefore, I should ensure the employees work hard by managing, and as manager, I should closely supervise them. So I can't let you alone, because you will take that 15 minute break, and I'm gonna have to watch you. Because really what you're trying to do is you woke up this morning, and what you tried to do is figure out how you went to bed this last night and then woke up this morning and I know this was on your mind. How can you get over on my company? How can you get over on me? How can you get something for free? You're lazy. <laughs> and I have been appointed, anointed by the company or God or somebody to keep you from doing that. Right? That's that theory. Next is the manager should create. So, therefore, I should create very strict rules. Right? You ever seen the movie uh, Office Space? Yeah. <laughs> this is this. This is it. <laughs> I got to create these rules. Right? Uh, uh, strict work rules implement a well-defined system of rewards and punishments if you don't get that just to control you so you need to be controlled now we know that that's not a good way to have an outlook now we also know some people have that they're going to i'm not saying what i'm saying is understand both of these theories right and then get to the other side understand what lens you're looking through and when you need to look through which one theory why employees are not inherently lazy Given the chance, employees will do what is right for the organization. Basically, get out of the way, and they'll probably do things the right. Right? We've been there before. If that you said I let so and so fail, yeah. actually, we would have done a good job if you not showed up. Right? You've been in that. Right? You let people come in. If you would just quit meddling with me, and I've seen a lot of people do that. Just let, let you fail. So, uh, so therefore, as a theory, why I will allow employees to work in the organization's interest. Managers then here's the key must create a work setting that provides opportunities for work to exercise initiative and self-direction. Remember that, you gotta create something. You still gotta do something as a manager. That's not just being all free, hippie loving, and you go do what you wanna do, right? And I just trust that you're gonna do right. I have gotta create an environment that provides you opportunities to do that. Because if I just leave you there, and you don't have the opportunity to excel, you probably won't, right? You're probably not gonna jump up and say, you know, I gotta create those opportunities. Uh, Therefore, managers should decentralize authority. We talked about that. Empowerment is what that is and to employees and make sure employees have nest, have the resources necessary to achieve their organizational goals. Right. So I I keep saying this as a manager, you need to make sure your people have what it what they need to do their job. That's really what you're managing is their stuff and making sure they have it. Now here's the interesting about both of these. Both of these theories, whichever one you prescribe to as a manager, guess what you got to do. In both of these, you work hard. Management is hard work. You're going to have to do hard work. It's not the labor, but it's hard work. You got to think. And you look over here, you got to make a bunch of rules, right? Look at that. They got to create strict rules and implement them. What does that mean? You got to be there all the time. And you got to, when they're, when they're, when they're done, 
you get to go home, you got to make more rules, right? You got to do punishments, stuff you hear bosses about all the time. Y'all go home and I got to handle all this other stuff. So it's hard work. Over here for theory why to be effective, you still got to do hard work, right? You've got to create a work setting that provides opportunity. You got to think what is best for the people to have right now. I got to give them the right resources, plus how can I get the best out of them? What is it that I need to do? So when you have those four computers to get to those 10 employees, you've got to be creative and think the best way to maximize, because the company only gave you four new ones, how am I going to get the most out of this, right? Do I just give it to my friends or do I give it to so-and-so or what? Those, it's still hard work. So if it's going to be hard work anyway, which one do you want to prescribe to? Well, obviously, I think we'd want to be managed this way, so therefore we should manage this way, right? Do unto others as you do unto, the, unto yourself, right? Has nothing to do to you, I mean. But that's the same thing. I mean, if you want to be managed this way, you'd want to manage it way. So that's the difference. Remember this, though. Sometimes we spend, what, 80% of our time on 20% of our employees? Get those bad apples out there? There are some people, right, <laughs> that work, they don't really care. They are lazy. They're bad. We've experienced that. So sometimes you just can't get around that, right? But for the most part, theory why generally accepts that's the way people are. You just got to know which theory to operate within and where you're at. Also, check yourself when you're doing something. Which theory am I operating from? And think of it this way. You can read the theory, but am I doing this because I think that they want to do bad things or that they're lazy, or I'm doing this because uh, I know they're trying to do the best? Think about that before you make that next business decision on someone or leadership decision. I have to do that all the time because if I don't watch it, I say I'm not and I don't want to be because I, I can read that and go, that's not me. But then I go, well, wait a minute, What's, why, am I, why am I really making this decision on this particular person? Why did I just make this policy or this rule? Oh, well, because they were late or they did this or, oh, yeah, I'm in the X now. I'm assuming this. So what can I do as a manager to reverse their habits and their trends of what they're doing without creating a policy or rule that affects everybody else? Right? Don't you hate that shotgun blast? So-and-so is late, right? I'll tell this story. My wife is so late into this. She probably, she kind of watches some of this stuff. She probably watched this one. So she's going back to school to teach. And she says, she comes back. She's like, I was like, how was your little meeting, you know, for you get ready? Well, the big meeting, but all the teachers at UCA get together in the nursing department, new boss and everything. She said, oh, good. Everything's right. My respect is set, but now we got a dress code. Now, my wife has a doctor by her name. And they have to give her a dress code, right? She don't like that. She dresses professionally and nice. But some days you can do a little bit less if there's not a code because you know when you understand. They're not interacting with students, right? I'm up here today and I just got to get some things done. I have meetings so I can, you know, but if I'm going to be on the podium or if I got to deal with somebody else in the university, you dress a certain way. So she understands and gets that. But now she has to dress a certain way every time that there's no leeway. And I said, because I listened to her when I talked, and I gave, I gave her two names. I just said the two names. She goes, yep, that's exactly why we got to do it. Because <laughs> two out of about 30 take advantage. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's a brand new boss who used to be one of them. And so now everybody's grappling. And now they're mad, right, at those two who they like. But now that you see the tension, sorry, like day three, you see the tension going. Because I mess with every day. Because they sit with just professionally. And every morning she asks the same question. How do I look? Right before she goes out, it's so now I'm still saying it's beautiful. Like I do, I said, well, you look professional and beautiful because it's the professional look. And, and, but I'm really getting after it. But so what I'm thinking is, is about the boss. And I'm thinking to her, I'm saying, you know, in my mind, see, that's the boss, Theory X. She doesn't want to be, and she's probably not Theory X all the time, but she made that decision off of Theory X. She had a couple, and she let that drive that. Instead of going straight to those two and saying, here, here's the deal. When I was working with you last year, I noticed you wore that. Star Wars shirt, like Yoda. That was like one of them she wore all the time. She loves Star Wars. Well, really in this, because they make these students wear a certain dress code, you need to have a dress code. But she had to put that rule in there. Well, when you define dress code, guess what it does? It's hard then to use common sense. Right. So when, you know, my wife has to go to work and it's that day that she's only going to be there three or four hours and all she's doing is no interaction with students and they got to get her office work to do. Now she's got to dress a certain way. Where before, she never would wear the T-shirt and jeans, but she would wear something a little less. Can't do that right now. Theory X, just driving the decision. So think of that as a man. So the boss is not trying to be bad. The boss is not thinking that she's in Theory X. But, see the, you know, like you but said, I can the see that. The boss have to know when to make it. 
how, you know, uh, and say like, hey, you know, you guys dressed like this last year, just be on the same level as everybody else. You know, yep. instead of punishing the whole crew, because even that whole crew, yeah. You know, now they mad at these other people. Now they they don't like the bosses. Much. Yeah, second, third order effects, right? Because you've made you know. a decision. Exactly, you're hitting it. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That leads to ultimately toxic leadership, which this is not there yet. But see what you know. I talk about it, it seems petty when I say, "Well, yeah, the computer is just a small example." This is even more bringing home example. Yeah, this is why. This is how this happens. So you, if you look through the lens, and that's why these two theories are important. Okay, as a leader or a manager is. Check yourself before you make that decision. Because I fell into those traps before, and I have to say, now, wait a minute, why am I making this decision? It's kind of the same thing when I'm dealing with my kids, you know, I'm dealing with folks. Yeah, exactly. So where, 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 yeah, why am I thinking this away? And, what, and what's my second, third order effect? So anyway, those are, that's the reason we know and do that. The management science theory, we just moved on a little bit more. Contemporary approach, so it's new, to management that focuses on the use of rigorous quantitative techniques to help managers make maximum use of organization resources. So what they realized with everybody else, they said, you're getting there, but how do we look at quantitative techniques? This is where people come and say, we got to be able to measure what it is you do. We can measure everything you do, and we look at your resources, right? So, hey, y'all have talked about people for the last 60 years. What about measuring resources? So that theory comes along. Yep, numbers and everything else. But you can't do it numbers alone, so then they come up with the next theory. So, latest thing out is this one and the next one, which this one is, is an open system. So what they're saying here is your system is open. That means stuff comes into your world, whether you want it to or not. And it affects it, right? No matter what. So you have the input stage, you got raw materials, money, capital, uh, you turn that into your, your machines, computers. You then turn that into goods and services, which equals your sales and your output. And then you go right back around. But in any stage, you can be interrupted. So uh, your inputs from raw materials, money, or capital, or human resources is interrupted. It's not like you thought it was going to be, which affects your conversion of it, which affects your output, which affects your sales, which takes you back into your thing. It's just a cycle. All the saying here is, and it's important, is that you know and understand that the open system theory, which is really true, it's just defined that. It's kind of like saying Newton invented gravity or what? He just defined it. He knew there was gravity. He just defined it. This is just saying in an organization, you have to take into account, bless you, you have to take into account that things can affect you from the outside that you do not control. Contingency theory says, yeah, you're onto something, but uh, it's saying that there is uh, going to be something in your environment that affects you. And there's a couple different ways you can do that. If you're in a stable environment, you want it to pick this away. If you're in a non-stable environment, you want to pick this away. So this one the book likes, this is one of the ones that I just, I don't like, but it's in the book and they want to teach it. It's a theory. Uh, so hard to argue theories, you just say they're there. But they're saying there's no, and I get this, that, bas that statement is good at the bottom. There's no one best way to organize, organizational structure depends on the environment in which the organization. Uh, organization operates. So we understand that what works for you in your private business won't work at a school, which won't work at an insurance company, which won't work for the government. I don't like the way they pigeonhole you into these two. Because just because you're stable don't mean you need it this way. Just because you're unstable don't mean you don't need it that way. But they're talking as a general rule. Whatever. All right. Those are our learning objectives. We hit those. So what are your questions? All right, so, so for the test purposes, read over chapter three. Read all three chapters before you take the test. These are going to be knowledge-based questions, but as we go for, forward, get in the habit because they're going to be application-based. Um, what you do want to know on the test, uh, first chapter, a few of those things, management, those definitions. The next, you will, you'll be looking up who failed and those people are and what they said. So you'll get a question like, who said this, and you'll have four names. So it's easier when you've already read the chapter and understand the theories. Because if you're not careful, the way the book does it, they kind of mix the names between here and there. So you'll see it, you tie it to the name. If you understand the theory, it'll come easier. As the tests progress, they'll get harder that way, meaning you need to understand the material before you get to it. Um, so it becomes a very knowledge-based. First test is if you go online and you look at your, your teacher and you get the instructors, it looks a lot like what they gave me. It's very knowledge-based. But by the second, third test, 
I'm tired of their questions and I start adding way more to it to get after it. Not trick at all. It's just you gotta understand those things. Do you discuss your questions? Answer those. Uh, what we want out of those is real simple. Tell me something that you read in the book. Let me know that you read the book and then apply it to you. So on the, the, this, this, how many discussion questions are there? Like three, I think. Three, okay. okay. Eight. I, it's, it's huh? eight. eight or nine. Chapter two is chapter one. Oh, you're talking eight. about the discussion questions right here in the book? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. But I, I got you certain ones to answer. That's what I thought. That's why I was trying to make sure that it wasn't the whole. Chapter one is one through eight. Chapter two is one through two. Is it? Okay. Let me look at my timeline and see what I put in there. Week one. Okay. He is, you also only answer three out of the eight, though. Oh. Yeah, that's what he just said. Just ask. No. <laughs> just catch your question week one. Let me look and see. Let me see what I put in there. I hope that's the form, but I don't want that. My bad. Yeah, he's trying to give me down on those questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Assignment. There we go. Yes, yes, yeah. One through eight, one and two, and one through four. Eight questions and answer three out of the eight. No, 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 no. You want to type up? There's three. You got the right to change it. Yes, I do, but no. There's three chapters. Yes, answers. Uh, these are pretty easy, but you'll answer these in a few sentences. But you will need to don't give me your opinion without the book, but don't give me just a book answer and the definition. Those two, those go together. Those should be answered. And of course, we got the Sunday night to do those. You have to the time to do your test, and then think about what it is you want to do your paper on, and let me know. And then uh, everything where we're going to do this, everything is always due on the Sunday night after the class. So I'll set the time up in the test. Oh, well, that's the last thing too. If that test like times out on you, or cuts you out in the middle and gives you a bad grade or you lose connection, I'm okay with that. Here's what you gotta do though. You gotta let me know when that happens, like right then. Don't call me in two days and say, man, that test cut out on me, I lost my connection. Can I retake it? If you call me or email me or take me home, just text me and say, I just took the test. It, and I can see it, but I'll see exactly when you log on, I'm gonna cut you off. Uh, I'll go back and reset your time for you, you know, but it obviously as you understand the theory X side If you call me three days later All right, I got it. You know, no the theory X if you're worried about the test you would have called me as soon as it did right. I know so it did. The uh, They will all do multiple choice or fill in the blank mm -hmm. It's a mixture, mm -hmm. a mixture. Mm -hmm. And how many generally how many uh, How many courses are on this? Like 10. About 10. Okay. 10 or so, about 10 points a piece. They're, they're heavy hitters, 10 or 12. On the split. Yeah. And yeah. How, many, how much time do you generally do? It's like 30 minutes an hour or two hours. I get plenty of time. Hour. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got to just put the A, B, or C. Now, also, and we'll get to number two, quiz two, three, and four. What you'll find out is if you put an S on the word or you misspell the word, because I built the test in web study, it has to have exact. I tried to work out all the bugs. But because I don't use theirs, anyway, it will count it wrong. Do not freak out. I read every test question. I oh, analyze every one of them. So if everybody missed the exact same question, first of all, I put the same answer and they missed it, I was wrong. So I'll throw it out. And I'll and you'll see me come on in the discussion and I'll tell so you. So like if you misspell a word, you're saying though? Right. Like if we type in the Senate in there and we misspell. Well, oh, I'm gonna ask you this. I'm gonna ask you a theory, right? And you're gonna right. have to tell me what that theory is. So if that theory is hyphenated in the book and you forget the hyphen, uh -huh. which I've fixed, I think most of the hyphen ones, but if you that or you put an S on it or you do a typo, it the test only knows what the answers that I put in there, the possible answers. Oh, okay. that's the logic okay. behind it. Okay. So but they make me use that. That's fine. So what I do is you'll see that and you'll know it's right. You can email me, that's perfectly fine. I don't mind. But I go through every test and I look at every one to see what you answered. Okay. And so like fail, like then, that's still was still F A Y O L, yeah. So if I misspell that, it may right. say I got it wrong, but you know yes. what I was trying to Right. And I'm gonna go back okay. and, and you'll go back and you'll see it and I'll also put the comment. You misspelled it, no problem. Okay. Your grade's good to go. So you'll see it, you'll have that. Some people it'll affect their grade and they'll be upset, but I'll fix that. That will happen in the second or third test. Uh, but uh, again, the other thing I do is I analyze every question 
Um, so I'm big on those and want to get them right. So again, if I see a certain amount of the class missing them, you'll see me come on and I'll type something up and I'll, I'll re-explain it and I'll throw that one out. Mm -hmm. You know, so and because I missed it, I, I didn't teach you obviously. If everybody, so if, so I'm just trying to make sure. So if there's a, a, a question and you want us to fill in the blank, now we may understand it, but our words may not all be the same. Like you know, you know what I'm saying. Yep. I'll read it. No, 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 not like that. But I'm just saying, like, if it's an a answer that you have to type out, like a sentence or something like that, he may say, describe um, or Hawthorne, you know, and I may say, Hawthorne invented whatever he done, you know, his thing that he done, you know, and you may say the same thing, but just in different yeah. lingo. You may use different words. I would read that and, and give you credit. However, in the test itself, quiz, that's what the discussion questions are for. In the quiz, you only have a one or two answer. Like until you'll see it, it will have like if it's two words, I have two lines. Okay. So you can know that that's supposed to be two words. And some people get confused and they put the one word in there and don't put the second part. That's fine if you get that. Uh, and I got the ability to get partial credit too. Mm -hmm. So if you come back and defend your answer is why you put that and it's good. But again, because the class, I mean, this is actually about 13 or 14, 15 people in that. I've had up to 24, 25, but it's still not very big for me in my mind. So I look at every single one of your answers. I go through okay. them and see what you answer. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, if you if there's a typo or anything else, uh, it ain't going to be fixed immediately. Depending on when you took the test, I look at them pretty much every evening once I open the test up, which will be open tonight. So I don't open the test up typically until after the class. Uh, then uh, you will take it any time between now and Sunday, and then I will, I said, I'll get credit. And if you think you got it right, I had several pretty good discussions back and forth. If you think you got it right, then you it, it with you yeah, okay. I'll look at it and see, and depending on what you said and what you you know have to do and say. And then again, like I said, uh, the last couple of classes, I don't think I've thrown anything out. Uh, it's just me refining my process. But as I notice my questions, or if you know, I'm, I'm human, so I miss something in instruction. You guys miss it, and everybody misses it. It's my fault. I'll throw it out. But you know. Quiz is a certain part, uh, discussion is a certain part. None of them are set up where anyone thinks my failure. Cool. All right. Well, I appreciate y'all. I'll see y'all next Thursday. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, I hope it ain't raining out there. I know. We take a boat to home. <laughs> All right, have a good one. All right, y'all too.